I guess with this one, but uh, I, fe I feel very weird talking to so many, not few people, but uh, yeah, very early morning. So I will keep the mic on, I guess. It's probably better for many of you. Uh, my name is Sandra Corsetti. Uh, thank you for joining us so early for this session. Uh, I'm sorry for those who sit behind me, but that's just the, the, how, how it is, I guess. Uh, I'm uh, the director of the Youth and Media Project at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, which is a research center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so in the United States. Uh, it's officially part of Harvard University. Uh, I'm joined by many, many colleagues, so I did not plan this session on my own. Uh, I will introduce them in a second, and I think because we are not so, so many, we can also do quickly then a, a round of introduction. But I wanted to take at least a few minutes to, to talk, at least for me again, as I said, it's very, very early, to kind of more on an observational level, share with you some thoughts that uh, we had when planning this session uh, to get us more into this mood of what are the implications of this technology. So if that's something that you are your thoughts with that, and then we'll do brief introductions by everyone. Thank you. 
censored by their governments. And finally, I just want to say something about the persistent gender gap uh, we all know still prevails. And um, it has a, uh, it, this gap can have profound impact on young women and girls and their uh, participation in digital economy. Uh, that uh, currently about 12% men are more online than women. Or let me put it the other way. Um, the global proportion of girls using the internet is 12% lower than that of men. But also girls and young women are less represented in economy in general. So while uh, labor participation for young men is about 53% uh, of those between 15 to 24, it's only about 37 for women. And these uh, disparities uh, actually mask, uh, th these figures mask disparities in countries where actually uh, we can see that a high proportion of girls and women have a uh, possibility to participate in labor economy in those countries where uh, women's and girls' rights are not at equal part to those of boys and men. Uh, so in order to, to, to uh, foster and support the girls' participation in digital economy, we need to uh, be able to provide better access for girls, but also to take into account of uh, different social and cultural and gender norms that restrict this participation. So uh, sometimes these training programs for girls, for example, should be uh, uh, bringing the education to them if uh, the girls have a restriction of movement in those countries where they can't move freely uh, as boys. Uh, we also need to provide training to girls that help them learn business and ICT skills. Uh, there are programs that we wrote about in Uganda and in Kenya that are helping young girls uh, uh, develop entrepreneurship skills through uh, training that we offer. But um, also uh, we need to take into account the specific needs of young women uh, very often uh, if we pro provide remote learning and uh, remote digital economy opportunities, we can also support women who are staying at home and working from home, young mothers, for example, which uh, is more difficult to do when uh, 
they need to leave the home. And, and finally, uh, when we talk about skills for young people and particularly for girls, it is important to bring in the private sector. I'm glad that we have representatives of the private sector and companies here because uh, it's e equally important to match the development of skills of young people and adolescents with the labor opportunities and the job market. And I'm talking both of the formal and informal sector. So uh, private sector has a very important role to play to support the development of these skills. And we hope to uh, stay engaged with all of you in this conversation to see how we can jointly do more to enable a greater proportion of young people to benefit from digital economy. Thank you. I think we're going to do the, the five interventions all one after the other and then open for conversation. So with this, Andres, please, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, thank you for organizing this session. I'm, I'm glad to be here. So I, I would like to talk uh, now a little bit about like, these uh, activities that you is uh, developing online, particularly uh, in emphasis and attention to the kind of um, activities that create some sort of capital. And this is a, a framework that we borrow from the digital inequality researchers, especially the ones who have been looking at how uh, the benefits and tangible, tangible uh, outcomes of using the internet or participating online are not distributed equally. So there are a lot of differential outcomes. Uh, these uh, inequality researchers have been especially talking about like uh, the difference in looking for, for instance, recreational activities online or activities that are uh, more um, leading to finding jobs or like uh, debating pub public issues or uh, seeking financial information. However, we, we discover uh, at looking at the activities that youth are doing online that it's not only this kind of, uh, kind of financial capital oriented activities that youth are doing, but they are also earning other kind of capital, such, such as social capital and cultural capital. So even what adults sometimes uh, categorize as uh, kind of recreational activities, for instance, using Instagram, sharing pictures of your favorite food or like uh, developing uh, games in an online world uh, that are framed as recreational, sometimes they are leading, uh, they lead to certain kind of capitals that are intangible. So this is very important because at some point, for instance, as uh, with the examples that Sandra was showing at the beginning, such as the video bloggers or the fashion bloggers or even like the um, YouTubers, uh, video game commentators, as they build uh, personal brands online, develop bi big audiences, they are able to translate their social capital, let's say their network of followers, uh, and as well their cultural capital, for instance, their reputation as skillful uh, video game players or as uh, stylish uh, uh, fashion bloggers, they are able to translate those opportunities into economic uh, outcomes. Uh, for instance, they establish collaborations with, with brands. They can also do what is called advertorials, that is like uh, doing videos uh, about a particular project or taking pictures of a restaurant in a collaboration uh, with a specific companies who actually are providing some remuneration. Um, so this is what we have been discovering and, and there are like a, a lot of challenges uh, on this approach but uh, we, we think it's important to raise those issues. One of the major challenges is like how can you measure uh, capital that is uh, kind of intangible, right? Like social capital or cultural capital, particularly for youth who is not becoming the state, is not uh, uh, still achieving the status of social influencers, because uh, nowadays we live in a world where, where a lot of uh, youth social influencers get a lot of visibility, but they, they are very few. It's very difficult to become a YouTuber with a global audience, or it's very difficult to become a, an Instagrammer who can actually get paid for their pictures. However, a lot of youth is doing this, like as uh, Jasmina mentioned, there is like millions of youth participating in, in, in these platforms with the hope, uh, with the aspiration of some time uh, breaking it into the market. And, and this, uh, when we, when we think this in the global landscape, uh, as Leonel was mentioning, especially with the difference between the 
global south and the global north, we, we see like a, a lot of these influencers are coming mostly from the global north. So for, for youth who is positioned in these uh, countries uh, with uh, low levels of, uh, um, let's say, connectivity, low levels also of uh, socioeconomic uh, sta status, uh, for, for them it's even more difficult to reach this uh, position of influencers and to translate their social and cultural capital into earnings. And I, I for me, for instance, a, 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 per, a, a researcher and um, person who is positioned between the global south and the global north, it's very interesting to go back and forth, for instance, between Colombia and the United States, looking at what youth is doing in this particular context and realizing how, like, even like, for instance, youth from Colombia is trying very hard, uh, particularly for, for instance, Afro-Colombian youth from marginal places to, to break it into the music market using SoundCloud or developing videos in YouTube, they rarely reach more than 200 views, right? If you compare this with like a million views of a, of a video blogger uh, from the United States. So there are like a lot of uh, issues to consider in like who is well positioned, wh what kind of youth is positioned to actually benefit uh, at this level and at this economy of a scale uh, in a world where like the visibility of like uh, even the content that they are producing is, is, not, uh, is not equal. Um, and this brings me to my final remark and is related to the paradoxical nature of like this digital economy uh, for youth and it's like on the one hand they encounter a, sp a space where they can pers pursue their passion and develop these entrepreneurial uh, activities uh, with the hope of uh, breaking into a market, bringing innovations uh, from their different, uh, different subcultures into um, a kind of like a big audience, but however, like uh, the platforms and the algorithms and the data sometimes is not uh, available for them to really understand how they can like reach uh, the specific markets that they are willing to. Uh, so I, I, will, I will conclude with this kind of paradox of like the, the, the contradiction between like be, being able to feel free to pursue any passion, any, any interest in culture or in, uh, in, in production, uh, but it's still like um, confronting the barriers, not only of access, but also like of like their positionality and visibility in these global and even regional networks. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Andres. Uh, so with this, uh, Marcelino, the floor would be yours and Alexa next. Thanks, I'm um, very glad to be here. And uh, competence. Eh? Uh, I, let me put it just in a little context of this, which is a recommendation that uh, the Commission made, uh, the, the Council adopted, the Commission uh, proposed in 2006 and it's now being renewed. <laughs> in 2019, which is a recommendation for competencies for citizens to live in the paradigm of uh, lifelong learning in the digital society. These competencies are eight, uh, citizenship, uh, literacy, language, uh, mathematics, and also, of course, including uh, digital. And digital is uh, seen to be key. We are lagging behind in general, not only young people, citizens in Europe are lagging behind. There is a, you have mentioned that, a mismatch, a tremendous mismatch in between the market needs and uh, what people can do uh, in terms of digital. And this is what I would like to, I have a slide here. This is actually the framework, uh, which is uh, online. You can download it, I have distributed a few copies, but you can download it from our web. And this is a consensus after many, 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 it's very simple, but a, consens a consensus after many, many consultations in between our services and our stakeholders in the European Union. And we came up with uh, five uh, competence areas which are key, <coughs> information and data literacy, communication and collaboration, digital content and creation, which is very, very much important, safety and problem solving. And in every one there are what we call competencies, and inside we have the descriptors of those competencies. You will see uh, in the next slide 
something that uh, is uh, showing also the proficiency levels, because you can be more or less proficient in terms of digital. Uh, let me say something in between brackets. A study by ICLS showed that uh, although young people now, uh, your generations, are said to be native, native, digital native, they are not necessarily competent, yeah. digital competence, because digital competence is much more than using a word or using, using an open uh, the internet and all that, that children can do very fast, even faster than me. <laughs> but <laughs> in, indeed, uh, digital competence is much more, as we have seen before, it's also security, it's also promoting creativity, it's also doing the most with the skills in a safe, creative manner. And uh, problem solving and trying to get information which is correct and which discard the other one which is not correct and solving problems uh, thanks to the information society technologies we, we are living and now we, we are embedded. Uh, this is the, five, the eight, actually there are four big levels, let's say, the foundation, the uh, intermediary, the advanced, and the, the champions, the, the, those that are specialized. Eh? And from here to there, we call that the paradigm, of the, 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 the metaphor of uh, navigating, of swimming in the digital ocean. And we have constructed that, and it, this is being very, very much adopted by many organizations. Uh, and we have recently published a guide in the next slide. I put the, the, uh, just the title. You can also download it from our website. This is the guide to implement what I showed before, which is the conceptual framework. So there are happening many, many experiences in Europe uh, which are taking our framework and adopting and creating applications to, for instance, assess, evaluate, see how young people behave, helping people also to find a job, because we find that uh, there is a tremendous in young people, a tremendous problem. They ha are early leavers sometimes. They, are, uh, not, they have no sufficient skills. They have to be in a continuous, in a continuous uh, uh, adaptation and learning, and this is not possible very much possible if it, you have no a structured manner to do with. So there are many applications across Europe. I would cite something called Compass, uh, which is a, a beautiful project that reads, the title reads, Your Journey to Digital, the Upskilling Platform for Young Unemployed People. This is one big, big platform uh, that paid a visit the other day in Seville, and is using our framework to create applications for people, for young people to learn, to adapt to in a structured manner following the, the taxonomy of uh, competencies that I showed you before. LN for Work is another application, a nice application, which is mapping digital skills of student young workers for employment, again the same. And like this, there are several others in Europe. <coughs> so important projects. Uh, all of them are in the Digcom Interaction Guide. If you go there, this is a, an interactive, clickable PDF where you can travel by subject, nationality, uh, young, uh, uh, unemployed, and many, many others. And you will see the experiences that are happening that are uh, a big, big number, more than 50 that I have counted in Europe out of the framework. So what is important, uh, I'd like to stress, is that uh, 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 dig dig digital competence are evolving. It needs a framework. Now that artificial intelligence is coming to stay with us, we would need also to, to see how people behave in front of uh, uh, artificial technology in uh, robots. And this is something also that has to be learned and will become also a skill and will become also a, a, a competence in general for citizens and especially for young people looking for a job. I will stop here. Thank you so much, Marcelino. So you heard at the very beginning a quick intervention about what who is contributing online, who is participating from Jasmina. Andres mentioned more what kind of capitals or what are young people gaining out of this. Marcelino spoke about one framework, uh, particularly coming from a governmental entity. 
that looks at skills and uh, mentions the importance of skills. And I think with this, I give it over to Monica, who is also going to talk about skills, but more from a company side. Alex, I think we have one more slide there. Thank you. Lori. Not the work that Facebook has been doing around uh, young people who are using our platform. Um, I am indeed representing my colleague Karuna, who is based in California. Unfortunately, her visa didn't come through. We w she waited until the last minute. So as I was, um, actually my flight was about to depart, she called me and said, can you, can you fill in for me? And I said, sure. Um, but she is the expert on safety on Facebook, and I'm sure I can put you in contact with her if you'd like to, you know, deep dive in some of the issues that I'm going to talk about. Um, um, I clearly didn't dress well for these very hot rooms. <laughs> I'm wearing wool socks, so uh, pardon my... Uh, <laughs> I'm not in menopause yet. Um, Do you want me to keep doing that so you can speak? Um, I know, I know. Um, so I just like to start, I just like to um, make some comments about some of the topics that um, um, were raised in um, some of the, especially by uh, Jasmina and uh, Marcelino. Um, Jasmina, you mentioned economic gaps and um, quality and education gaps and um, also social and cultural gender, gender norms that are different. Um, and I, before I dive into the safety um, topic, which I was supposed to talk about, I, I would just like to, you know, mention that um, Facebook nowadays is a thriving platform for women. Um, uh, so many thousands of women are using Facebook to promote their business and to work from home. Um, I, of course, I wasn't planning on talking about this, so I haven't got the numbers, but I'll be happy to share numbers with you. And um, these are just amazing stories that we're seeing every day of how Facebook is enabling um, these women to just bring income to, to their homes and also stay at home and, and um, you know, depending on the, the culture and also care for their, their kids. Um, and also uh, regarding economic and quality in education, um, we are developing a series of um, hubs around the world. And I'm gonna talk about the hub we um, recently um, opened in Brazil, which is called Estação Haki. Um, it's been um, going on for about a year and a half now, and we developed the program to be aimed at young, um, um, unemployed uh, Brazilians who have no digital skills. So um, in a year and a half, we are close to reaching 10,000 people already trained. So these people go come to Estação Haki and they learn how to code and they learn how to program. Um, they have mentorships from professors, from um, you know startup uh, companies. A lot of them leave the course employed, um, and a lot of them have the skills to you know start their own businesses. So um, this is an amazing work, and I I know the numbers for for, for Brazil, but I know we're doing this. Um, in several countries around the world, and I'll be happy to provide more info if you know anyone would like to to know a little bit about more. Um, we we also take our um, responsibility um, around safety very seriously. We understand that if people, especially young people, are not feeling safe at Facebook, they're just not going to be on Facebook. Um, and um, Um, so we are optimistic about the use of our platforms. As you, you know, portrayed your first slide, I saw different apps from our family of apps um, in there. And we know that young people are keen, especially on using Instagram, for instance. Um, and we truly believe that we have a responsibility to provide more skills to the young people who are using our platforms. Um, and I just very quickly like to um, walk you through some of the tools that we have in place nowadays. And one of the tools is our, um, our safety, safety portal. So our safety, safety portal has been around for a long time, but as we learn more about how
how people use our platforms, we're able to develop these tools even further. And we have recently added within the safety portal a portal that's dedicated to youth, right? So it's basically, um, it provides information um, that empowers the youth, um, our youth audience to, to use our apps. Um, um, but to use our apps, um, you know, uh, with conscious, right? So we give them tips on privacy. Um, we make the language on privacy settings appealing to a young audience so they know where they, where they can go to, to change their privacy settings. Um, we are also working with tips and resources around principles, you know, like are you, are you sure you want to share everything and, and, and things like that. So, um, and then within the, the, the Porto Youth, we have developed the um, digital uh, literacy library and that's, that's where this slide stands for. And the Digital Literacy Library was developed in partnership with the Berkman Center. And I would just like to point out and thank Sandra for being such a great partner. Um, a lot of the work that's there um, was developed for, by Berkman. And um, it's basically a um, library for digital literacy, right? Um, so we, and then um, among the many issues that it touches upon, um, there are several modules um, on, um, that are aimed at a young population on privacy and reputation, on identity, on positive behavior, on safety, on community engagement. And they're very easy to use lessons that can be downloaded and be used by parents and be used by teachers, by professors in the classroom. Um, and just before I was telling Sandra, just before joining Facebook, um, I was a full-time professor of law. And um, um, I just, as I was going through these materials, I was so happy to see how, it, uh, you know, how easy they are to use and how they can be used in different environments um, by different you know, people and really, really reach um, a large audience. So um, I know I have just, you know, very little time, but I just wanted to make sure that you know about some of the initiatives that we're taking. We're taking our responsibility towards safety and towards empowering the youth very seriously through a variety of programs. And I'm happy to deep dive into some of the issues that you might find more interesting. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you so much, Monica. And just to let you know that the lessons that are on the digital literacy library uh, from Facebook are available in 45 languages, so no matter more or less where you come from, uh, it should be there. And Alex, I think there's a next slide. So the lessons are all Creative Commons licensed, and the original platform where they're on is on the um, Berkman Klein's digital literacy resource platform, so you can also download them there. Currently only in English we're working on uploading all the translations, which is a lot of documents. Uh, but I think with that, the last intervention would be briefly from Juliana, and then we open up for conversation. Okay, so hi everyone. Thank you so much for being here so early. I told her that I have a three-year-old at home, so it's never early for me, it's always <laughs> really early in the morning. So I have a huge challenge here because I'm talking about youth in front of Brazilian youth, so <laughs> thank you so much. I, I know the program really well, so it's, it's an important job we're doing here. Um, and also that I have already changed my whole presentation because I'm the last one to speak, so I would love to touch on some of the issues that my colleagues brought today. So be patient with me because I just changed the whole thing. So uh, I think that the first message I would like to leave here is that at Google we believe that Internet has enhanced youth capacity to learn new things, to produce new content. I saw like a bunch of apps that I don't know because I'm not young anymore. So I think that nowadays we have, Internet has provided a lot of tools for uh, youth to produce content to be creative and to be heard. 
And for that, at Google, we believe in their capacity to change the world. So we have a bunch of programs like Creators for Change that tries to enhance their capacity to produce count online counter-narratives against hate speech. And in Brazil, we have a program that I, I love a lot that's called the Safer Lab. It's a program that we, uh, we developed together with the SaferNet, which is a worldwide organization that works with online safety. And we have been working with a thousand youngsters in Brazil from 15 to 22 years old and helping them to create their own projects to tackle hate speech, both online and offline. So we have these amazing stories, like from there is this guy who is a poet from the north part of Brazil in a community that's called Quilombo, and they don't have internet on that Quilombo. So he travels by boat to have internet access, and he's been uh, going through this capacity building programs through this project called Safer Lab, and now he's, he's created a collective of poetry in his quilombo to try to bring some good messages on how people can lead, deal with bullying and stuff. So this is, uh, there are many stories around, uh, like there is this collective on the south part of Brazil that work with transgender issues. So we are helping those teenagers and young people on how they can uh, boost their capacities to be heard and to produce good content and to, to, to be creative on dealing with such challenging issues. So the second message I would like to bring here is around economic growth that my colleagues brought here. So uh, we also think that the internet and Google's tools can uh, contribute to economic growth. And we know that unfortunately not everyone has already the necessary skills to take advantage of those digital opportunities. And we are committed on changing that. So uh, we have built a, a different types of initiatives that we, we connect them on the same, I would say, initiative called Grow with Google. And we have been uh, training people on digital skills, digital marketing, uh, helping them on how to become developers, entrepreneurs, and we have some uh, courses to teach kids on computer science. Um, and those, and we have a specific training for women that's called Women Will. So this year in Brazil, we have already organized six huge, like really big trainings in seven different cities in Brazil. And Grow with Google has trained like more than seven million people here in Europe. And I was here in Europe, but we make like I thought, where am I now? So seven million people here in Europe, and more than 13 people in Africa. And I would love to share some numbers of, of Latam uh, with you if you want. Uh, and we have this Women Will initiative that's training women on how to empower their capacity to have their own businesses so they can have also, we believe that financial empowerment is part of women empowerment as well, so they can have like more freedom and more options. So in Brazil this year we trained through Women Will 7,000 women on the whole country and we have lots of amazing stories like if you have the chance to be a part of uh, one of the trainings of, from Women Wheel in your countries, it's like I cried in all of them because we have amazing stories of women that are learning how to to find freedom from, I don't know, a difficult situation through economic opportunity. So it's really important. Also, I, I would like to bring uh, uh, another program, like we have been working in Brazil and the whole world, but I would like to bring my Brazilian perspective on media literacy programs because we believe that media literacy is a huge part on what we are going to build f uh, for the internet of the future, like for the present also, but for the future. So we are working uh, with the Ministry of Education in Brazil to build, because now we have a uh, common core, uh, how do I call it, the national curriculum basis? Curriculum. Yes, it's, we have, uh, it's similar to the common core, the K-12 on the United States. And media literacy is a pillar of this, it's, it's a, a principle of this uh, national curriculum. So we have been working with different NGOs and journalists and uh, schools to create content because it, this issue, we've been facing the misinformation issue in Brazil for a long time, but the media literacy debate, debate is so new for us because we have, uh, for that we need to develop new partnerships and to develop content that can help professors to implement media literacy strategies on their classrooms. 
Uh, finally, uh, we launched this year uh, in the US and in LATAM a new program called Be Internet Awesome. And the Be Internet Awesome also has lessons. And it tries to bring some uh, principles to kids uh, so they can be awesome on the internet, so that they can be responsible, uh, so they can practice digital citizenship, and, so, and also so they can be safe on the internet. So uh, it brings some principles around how to be smart and how to share with care, which is a really important concept. Uh, on how they cannot fail for fake, even if it's fake news or, I don't know, people trying to, I don't know, do bad things with them. Uh, that's uh, cool to be nice, so they need to take, they need to not only share with care, but be careful on what people might be feeling with what they share. And it teaches how he can, they can be brave, so they can, should always ask, ask for help because they are kids. Okay, so that's it. I'll be happy to share with you on the round of questions. Thank you so much. So this was it from the five interventions. You heard again at the beginning what kind of youth are participating and what are the struggles they're facing, what are the, the gains from this participation, and then the role of literacies and the importance of developing skills and competencies, however you call it. We already are using three different terms here. Um, we planned some questions for all of you, so we had 10 questions. Uh, but I, I feel like w you might not even need the questions because you might have your own uh, remarks you want to make. But the, the 10 questions are the following. So where you are coming from, what are the uh, opportunities young people are encountering? Um, what kind of capital are they, they gaining from your perspective? What do you think are their motivations uh, to engage online? Uh, do you feel like we touched on this at the very beginning and Andre spoke a little bit about it? Do you think they're cultivating an economic mindset? Uh, what are some of the short term and long term gains? Why do you think young people are engaging online in these opportunities as we spoke at the beginning? Um, how can we measure all of these contributions online? How important is the role of collaboration, networks, mentorship, for instance? What do you think about the power relationship between platforms and their young users? Uh, how do you feel about that? Uh, how do you think the lines between work and leisure or work and play, are they blurring? If so, in your perspective, how? Uh, and what are also the power relationships between adults and young people, and how is that affecting uh, young people in their role as uh, not just users, but consumers and producers. So these were our 10 big questions that we thought we'd throw into the room to hear your observations, but you might have other inputs to specific uh, interventionists. I don't know if that's even a, a word, but to people who spoke uh, before. Uh, any questions? Who is the brave first one? Yes, please. Uh, hello. And if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself again for the transcript. Thank you. My name is Gustavo Paiva. I'm here with Brazilian's Youth Program. And over the last two years, I've worked with SaferNet, which was mentioned already here. Um, me and a partner have in Natal, my city. That's Emily, her name. Um, we have taught about 500 children and about 400 teachers in our state about uh, online safety and we're trying to do, do, to do this good work. Um, we've worked with ISOC in this in a project and addressing those questions specifically, um, when I see children, the children I, I've taught, um, the, there is not a very strong dimension of econom economics for them. They, they become content producers as a form of play for children specifically, um, which, as, as has been mentioned here, they often have technical competences without having the maturity to fully use those tools. And for them, for this group of children from 12 below, they are making YouTube videos, they are trying to create an online presence, but it's more of a play thing. They don't think about the monetization of their videos and so on. It's more of a ludic thing, 
and it's a way to relate to their peers in their schools, in their, in, in their communities. And again, as has been mentioned, there is often a technical competence without the corresponding maturity, which is something we have to work a lot when we go to schools and in teachers. Teachers and parents, they don't fully comprehend this. They think that technical competence is associated with maturity. So they often let the children do as they please without fully comprehending the dangers or what can go wrong. That's what I had to say. Thank you. So do you, just an add-on question, do you think you spoke more about younger children? Do you think that changes over time uh, their mindset? You said they do it in the first instance uh, as a form of play. At what point do you think that switches? Well, specifically in Brazil, as they age and become teenagers, they often worry a lot more about academic pursuits. And some of them, I think, will drop down from this online production sphere. But I think this generation we are having now of children will evolve into a more mature perception of the economy around this. Um, the current teenagers, we, I don't see too often this economic perception still. But I think the children we have today, this generation, will mature into uh, a generation of content producers. Thank you so much. Any other thought? Oh, wow, now maybe one and then two. Uh, the University of Rosario. And and my, my intervention goes like along with Andre's intervention and and I would like to tell you about two examples that I as a YouTuber consumer experienced in Colombia that I think they are useful to see how young people are um, participating in, in economy. Uh, the first one is a YouTuber called Pau Tips. Uh, she's a um, a fashion blogger, and a, a, like six months ago, she did a, something really beautiful, and it's that she she was born in a poor town of Colombia. It's called it, it is called Capitanejo Santander. So, and now she studies at, at my university, and she has lots of followers. And in every of her videos, what what she does is to. Uh, to prove uh, like beauty stuff, and then he, she gives her opinion. So one day she decided to go back to her town with all the makeup he he has, uh, she had gathered for for doing the advertisement, and she stayed like in a in a public school in in the poor town and start to gift. Uh, this makeup to everyone, and she made a big deal, a video and uploaded to to YouTube. So she is an example of how uh, how university students such as her are expanding this YouTube culture to like towns and zones that uh, didn't know about these contents before. I, I think she is a good example. And another successful project of of YouTuber is that. <coughs> There's currently in Colombia a new wave of YouTubers. There is Juan Pablo Jaramillo, Nicolás Arrieta. And uh, they started some movement and they now write books. So you go to libraries in Colombia and you can find books uh, written by YouTubers. So uh, I think that's pretty cool because they are um, making young, young people be interested in things as literature. So, but now the bad thing is that, as Andres pointed out, it, there's not only a gap between like global south and global north, but inside of Colombia there's two a, a gap, and these successful projects of YouTubers, well, they go to private universities. So uh, I think the the aim is to expand this this kind of situations to poor Colombians too, and not only for. Colombians that are already uh, making these successful approachments to internet. Thank you so much. Please. Hi. My name is Harun Azim, as I told you before. I work at the uh, Telecom Regulatory Authority in Afghanistan. 
Uh, obviously, in Afghanistan, things are a lot different than uh, things are in the countries you belong. Uh, we, uh, like out of 37 million, only 4 million people are connected to the internet and uh, only very few of them, like maybe 10% of the people who are connected, they have quality service. So we are still like, because of uh, uh, like uh, insecurity and landscapes, we have like mountainous countries, mountainous country it is. So we don't even have like 2Gs everywhere where everybody else is talking about 5G and all. So it's very different, but still, like in in such, uh, there are some sex stories. But I think for uh, I'd like what I'd like uh, to have from you guys is uh, to like we are talking about opportunities, but we want them. We want to provide the opportunities. Like in other countries, there are opportunities. How do they use it? But we have to provide the opportunities. So I'd like uh, maybe uh, if. Uh, I'd share my uh, uh, email address and everything, and if anybody has good ideas or they can connect me and uh, give their ideas on how to improve their uh, their lives. We, uh, in, the, in the regulatory uh, authority we, I work in, we also have the TDF fund, which is the, uh, 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 what do you call it? It's uh, uh, access fund, like uh, to everybody. So we have the fund, but we are still waiting for innovative ideas and uh, uh, like where we can help others to get ac accessible. And so I think uh, my, my idea would be like to gain ideas from everybody else. That's why I came here. So I think it's, uh, if anybody has, I already, we already connected to Jasmine and uh, I think I'll also get your cards and contact you for ideas for everybody from our Fantastic, and I think for sure Jasmina has a lot of examples also from UNICEF innovation, yes, yes, yes. but Andres has some experience also looking at different case studies in Colombia where internet connectivity in certain parts is not great and people also travel by boat and so forth to gain yeah. higher connectivity. I don't know if people behind me and then maybe one and then two. So sure. you first. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Steve from UNICEF. Um, so thank you very much for the presentations and the talks. It's really interesting. Um, and I like this idea of the, the paradox because often for young people it's very difficult. Uh, on the one hand, you have this platform that you can reach the world on. On the other hand, there's so much social capital and, and structure around people that if you're poor and if I'm from South Africa, that many people have ideas but they don't have, they can't access capital, they don't have the networks. I, I wanted to just zoom out for a second um, and see if anyone is thinking about data um, because the examples so far are creating economic value uh, by getting followers or by selling something or by selling content. Um, but of course data has value and this, the, whole, the whole model, economic model of the internet today is built on data. So is, you know, if we start thinking about the value that young people have just by the data that they, they give away and of course by using platforms, you give your data, but you get a platform and you get this potential. Um, but I think there would be interesting work beginning to monetize from a user perspective, think about how that data can be monetized and how the inherent value that one has. Um, yeah, and, and in a way to also teach young people not just how to be safe online, not just how to be creative, but also to be conscious of the value that they have just by being users. So if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd, I'd be interested. I don't know, Andres, if you want to say something about that, but we are definitely at Berkman Klein looking into that uh, on both sides, one on the, on the platform side and how are they making money out of young people's data, but also looking at young people themselves and are they <coughs> tracking some of the activities and are they monetizing, what are they doing with their own data? And is that even in their heads something that they can conceptualize? Scholars have pointed out about like what does it mean to be spending all this time online with this energy and work when it's not compensated, right? So these issues of free labor, for instance, or hope labor or aspirational labor that you are doing like since very early ages, but they are never receiving any form of payment. So is this youth growing up 
uh, predisposed to, when they are adults, also continue doing this free labor and crowdsourcing and all of these internet activities without even having access to their own data. So yeah, but I think like it's crucial to to also focus on like literacies around data and, and starting to understand who owns the data, who has property on it, and how it's also being analyzed, uh, leveraged, uh, created for marketing purposes. Because at the end, it's like this growth. If you look at the economy on now, it, it has grow. It has grown a lot, but uh, it's in very particular spaces, right? Like in, in places where we have like this. Uh, well, the, the companies are based. It's not well distributed. I think it's in part because all this data is stored in certain places, not in, for instance, the Global South. We lack all these servers for storing data or processing it. user on Facebook between 13 and 18, you're going to get more warnings about the screen time that you're, that you're, uh, you're getting. And uh, you're going to get um, uh, messages directed at you. Are you aware of your privacy settings? And we're building language around that so that users know and they can decide at the end of the day how much data they want to share with, with the platforms. We feel it is um, extremely important to have that information more constantly sent to our young audience. Um, and also on well-being, because you, you touched upon that when you opened uh, the floor. Um, we are developing um, tools uh, both on Facebook and Instagram so that people um, are aware of how much time they're actually spending online. Um, we know that our studies shows that if uh, people are just passively consuming content, that might not be so great. But if they're acti actively um, engaging and building community, then that's, that's a good use of their time. Um, so on Instagram, for, for example, nowadays, I can keep track of how many uh, minutes or hours a day I'm using the app, and I can set uh, limits. So I set a 15-minute limit to my Instagram use. Um, and when I reach 15 minutes, then I get a warning. You know, this is, this, is, this is how much time you've spent today and this is how much you said you would. And you know, I think that that's, I, I've been asked a lot, um, is this in the business interest? And I'm, I'm, I'm just so proud to work at a company that where we can say to our users, look, you've, you've been online for too long. Maybe you should, you know, not be here anymore. And because we're really valuing well-being as opposed to just having people in our platforms all the time and that not being good, so thank you. I think we have one question behind me, then two, and then three, and then I want to make sure Christian, my colleague, also has enough time for his remarks, but maybe if you can, yeah. and please don't forget to introduce yourself. Okay, uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Bridipta, I'm from Indonesia. So I might not be giving a question per se, but I would like to uh, put on some, some input and share something back home. So uh, on the data issue that raised by the, the Facebook representative, I would like to say that many of Indonesian youth sees that this is a pro branding issue and customer uh, acquisition cost. So if we spend more time in, in our social platform, it's not that we think that our time is, is better to spend in, in, in Instagram or in Facebook, but it's something that we have to do because it, for, for some of the social influencers, this is something very uh, beneficial for us. Okay, and that's one. And second, yes, in, in Indonesia we have so many digital economy activities and it's not only positive one but also unfortunately some negative one. The uh, digital economy activities that happen in Indonesia is from uh, reviewing some food, traveling and do some endorsement and so on. But unfortunately there are some services offer like cyber billing service, escorting service like in Indonesia if we uh, do some graduation in the school and it's a very disappointment from the society that you do not have a couple or, or, or another uh, another friend that can help you take photos and so on. So that's that's another service being offered on the platform Facebook, and we have also the cyber bullying, uh service for two two dollars and some cents for for this this service. And we also have the social climber phenomena where people may want to be bullied by themselves or giving some controversial statement so they can get many followers, many viewers, many likes to gain uh, enough 
public attention, so eventually they may change the direction of their content to something either economically beneficial for them or only for their own uh, satisfaction. And other thing also we have uh, follower seller. So if you pay for ten ten dollars and or twenty dollars, you can have like thousand followers. You can have thousand likes. This can be done either through uh, technical technic technologically uh, perspective or these people profile that doing something controversial, they sell their own account to others. That, that thing, things happen. And for social uh, influencers, those who do, do endorsement, unfortunately, safety practices have not been really uh, implemented in, in Indonesia. So they, they sometimes share their own account in their caption. They sometimes share their personal information that should actually be protected in their own caption that can be easily be easily be extracted by anyone. They sometimes do uh, make up make up review in their own private room, so it is also exposed in Indonesia. Not to mention that Indonesia is also known with uh, distribution of illegal or well, not illegal per se, but counterfeit products. So they sometimes also happen to help the distribution and advertising of counterfeit product, which of course it is somehow violation to the law. This, this things of issue is currently happening in Indonesia and, and the government is trying to put it in the perspective and see how the policies can help this, but not really get into the grassroots level, unfortunately, probably from my input, yeah. Yeah, my name is Zahra Mahdi. I'm, uh, I'm the uh, advisor for uh, documentation team in Bahrain Center for Human Rights. Um, the first uh, note is about the woman empowerment. Actually, I'm, uh, I'm, I was interested in the note that you, you were saying that you have like um, training for the women who are starting their businesses through online. Recently in Bahrain, many women like decided to start working online through Instagram, for example, or Facebook. And you can like uh, see the difference between the proper stores uh, who has like uh, uh, CRs and they have proper people who are working online, even in the advertisement. Like you know that this one is working individually and this guy is, for example, has someone who is expert in using the, the internet. So even the design differs. So I think we need to talk like more about uh, how can we like make uh, use of these programs in Bahrain so we can help these women to, to, to be uh, better. Uh, the children in Bahrain, actually, we have uh, a rule that like uh, uh, guide the people who are uh, misusing the internet. And most of the people in Bahrain, like children, they are misusing the internet. For example, in Twitter, they are posting something because they are reacting with the hate speech. So they don't know the, the law, they don't, don't know the legal limits, again, because they are not uh, competent. They are using the internet only like without borders, without uh, very much uh, conscious. So they are sometimes being jailed, for example, for three months or even a year because they reacted with, with hate speech. So I don't know, like, um, if there is a limit in Twitter, for example, or in the Instagram, Instagram also, for the children who are using these apps, how, what, what is the limits of them? Like, how can we prevent them from being jailed, for example, for misusing this, these, uh, these apps or these uh, uh, accounts? <coughs> Thank you so much. I don't know if your intervention is very brief. Yes, no, I, the, the gentleman behind you is waiting. I'm so sorry. And then we have to go over to question because uh, otherwise my, the Swissness in me is already observing people outside, reminding me about time. So yes, please, in the back. Okay, thank you. My name is Ansgar Kuna. I'm from the University of Nottingham in the UK and also trustee of a foundation called Five Rights, which works on the rights of young people online. And I just wanted to raise the concept of age-appropriate design, which is something that's really being introduced in the UK now. It's also part of the new Data Protection Act, um, basically highlighting that, of course, youth is not really uniform. The way in which young people use the internet changes as they age. 
in many different stages. You don't go from young to adult in <coughs> one big step. And so that applies both to uh, really the way in which platforms need to interact with the user, uh, but also to the way in which the education is being done. So work we did um, at the university with young people, a lot of the feedback we got from them, for instance, was complaints that they get the same internet safety lecture every year, even though they use the internet completely differently as they age. Thank you so much. And maybe as a suggestion that the people who gave quick uh, presentations, if they can, uh, after this, wait outside. If people have specific questions for you, they can come and find you. But uh, my dearest colleague, Christian Fieseler, uh, professor at the BI Business School in Norway, faculty associate at Berkman Klein, has the wonderful uh, task to quickly summarize this and see where we're going uh, from here. So Christian, yep. the floor is yours. I will try my best. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much for coming here, especially to our colleagues from the Americas, right? Because we know and appreciate that it's very early for you. I just want to take maybe now kind of like one, two, maybe three minutes if the people outside allow us to, to maybe summarize a little bit our discussion. And I think it was a very worthwhile discussion to take a little bit of stock where we are when we are talking in terms of um, youth and the digital economy. I think we had um, somewhat in our discussion a little bit of balance between aspects of safety, of uh, safeguarding youth and children, but also looking at the uh, opportunity angle or the opportunities that are inherent in the internet and the digital economy for young people essentially growing into more independent, self-sufficient roles. Um, I think we raised a lot of interesting points, starting, for instance, from the idea of um, that sometimes we, especially as adults or older fellows, we might not always be in the best position to always understand what young people are doing and sometimes this might also lead to a kind of over um, emphasis on essentially curbing emerging practices, right? This idea of not understanding what youth are doing and then maybe being to be overprotective. I think we also had an interesting perspective or an interesting discussion in terms of um, or what skills are we talking about, right? Are we talking about traditional skills? Are we talking about safety practices? Or are we then talking about the maybe right now less emphasized skills, the creative skills? And I would maybe also forward the idea of strategic skills and building even on top of creative skills, right? The idea not of even being creative, being a creator, but also using that creativity in means and ways that might uh, give um, some additional impact or that might um, skill you for endeavors later on in life. We had um, an interesting discussion or interesting inputs about global perspectives or also in terms of how we need to understand skills, right? We talked about the matter of access and connection, but also the idea of socioeconomic backgrounds um, going to uh, matters of gender imbalances and socioeconomic and cultural capital. I would maybe just um, propose two points, right, in terms of, um, I, I think we had uh, two interesting um, discussion points maybe also for going forward. The one is the idea of policy matters, right, that maybe going forward we need to understand better what kind of gains youth are actually getting from participation. Do we actually already measure all the participation that uh, youth are bringing to the digital economy and which efforts are more visible than the others, right? Are we sometimes maybe overemphasizing efforts which are more flashy, like media production, and do we also capture well enough right now um, things which might create also longer term value, like uh, coding or um, knowledge creation? And finally, we also then raised maybe some forward-looking question. I think it was already a little bit inherent here in this discussion here um, to what kind of like economy are we skilling youth? Are we skilling them to the economy which we have right now? Or do we need to connect that with, for instance, matters of artificial intelligence and an economy that some observers might argue might look very different in 10, 20, 30 years when uh, maybe the traditional intelligence which we are using right now in terms of our just office work or so might uh, be complemented by artificial intelligence and what do we do then? And I think, Sandra, you are going to have an interesting session uh, for that yeah, tomorrow. Yeah, so there's one more slide and then we're leaving very quickly. 
Thank you for being here. so patient. So thank you for everyone for coming to this session. We have a few more connected sessions to, to this one, so maybe take a picture and then let's try to uh, make the room available for the people after us since we're already late. Thank you so much. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi. I suppose so, please. Oh. Si j'ai une question, je...
issues are still ongoing. This? Yeah. If I try to, no, it's. Hello? You can try to. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I think what, what the situation is, is we can't have two mics on at the same time. W yeah, which, so it creates feedback, which is maybe uh, a good thing, so. <laughs> um, thank you for bearing with us, uh, with, with the delay. Um, I, I want to introduce this panel on um, gender issues and democratic participation reclaiming ICTs for a humane world. My name is Sheetal Kumar and I am a program lead at Global Partners Digital, which is an organization based in the UK, but working globally. And this panel combines uh, two... Uh, what if I just don't use this? It's not because I'm being lazy, it's because we've had changes. Makeup. Actions and then. Okay. I think um, it wouldn't be an IGF without technical difficulties, so we would be robbed of that, um, that joke if, <laughs> if we weren't having some sort of issues. So we'll start right away, um, and I'll ask, I'll, I'll turn to um, the panelists on, the, on the, the side here to introduce themselves. Can you allow me just one minute? Yes. Just to present the in session one, just to tell you who we are. Of course. Uh, can I use the mic or not? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so welcome to Paris, because first we're a French organization, so we're glad to welcome you all. Uh, we're, um, Jamais Sans Elle was launched two years ago, uh, basically by men, uh, who decided not to attend any forum or uh, panels in which they were, there will be no single woman involved. So, and basically I think we succeeded because personally, uh, I, I do not see any more panel without women. I think in two years it changes a lot. It's not just because of us, of course. But that was our first uh, um, commitment, was just a simple commitment. And the organization evolved towards a much broader um, engagement, which was to um, involve in gender equality, uh, in every kind of fields, businesses, uh, media, etc., and of course, in the internet. So we have a, uh, a, we have a few panelists that are going to present themselves. But I was just wanting to uh, just to explain what was the, the, f the particular format of this session. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, and um, I think that's a really interesting example of how to promote gender diversity and a and a good example. Of, um, okay. Great, and we look forward to hearing more about how um, how that success came about, um, and whether or not it could be applied um, in other contexts as well. I think it will be really interesting to hear because the challenges differ so much from country to country. So um, I'll ask first for the panelists um, on one kind of side of the first panel that was merged with your panel, Jamais Sans Elle, to introduce themselves. Maybe it would be great to have a joint conversation. Uh, we we yeah. absolutely yeah. will. Um, we'll just have the introductions first. Uh, maybe I could start with you, Asa. 
I'm Sasha Kwester Semyon. I'm representing Jamais Sans Elle here. Um, yeah, I'm Asad Beg. I'm from Pakistan and uh, the founder of Media Matters for Democracy, which is uh, uh, co-hosting the session today. And very quickly uh, about Media Matters, it's an organization in Pakistan which is working to defend the freedom of expression, um, communications, and more importantly, the media freedom. And uh, primarily, we work on research and advocacy. And uh, very recently, we have found ourselves researching more and more into online spaces and how it's used or not used um, uh, in, in terms of a holistic democratic uh, participation in, um, uh, in, in various political conversations online. And uh, I'm hoping to talk more about that in the session today. Great. Thank you. Is this, this is not working anymore, is it? No, I think it's working. Okay. Oh, that's great. Can they still hear online? Uh, okay. Online, Sarah, online? Yeah, online. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so it's, it's oh, finally okay. fixed. Okay, excellent. Thank you for fixing. <laughs> I don't know who we owe the thanks to, but thank you. Um, and so, Asa, thank you for your introduction. Um, Bishaka, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name is Bishaka Datta, and I work with a nonprofit in India called Point of View at the intersection of gender, sexuality, and technology. Thank you. Okay. Hi, I am Aki Das. Uh, I am Facebook's public policy director for South and Central Asia. I'm based out of New Delhi, and um, I hope to be a voice of the region in this particular uh, session. Thank you. Noah? Uh, we, have, we have another panelist, too. Hi, uh, my name is Noha abdul from Egypt. I'm an ISOC IGF ambassador, and I work at Dell Technologies in the data storage field. Great, thank you. So you I think... And yes, please. Please, yes. Okay. Sophie, can you introduce yourself in a few words? You, your, yes, sure. Your general management of the Ecole 42. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, sure. So I'm sorry, I don't speak very well English, but I will try to be understandable. So I'm the managing director of 42, which is an unusual IT school. It has been created uh, five years ago by Xavier Niel. I don't know, maybe you know him. He's a French uh, telecom tycoon. He's the owner of one of the first telecom companies here in France. Okay, sorry. No, and uh, 42 yeah, is the first. Yeah, that will be okay for now. Okay, just, okay. just a presentation. Okay, okay. Okay. But your English, is, is, your English okay. is excellent. Thank you. Uh, Isabelle? So uh, I am Isabelle Galli. I'm working uh, in a French university called CNAM, founded in 1792. So it's a very old school. We have a lot of engineers and we have not so much women in. Okay. And I'm Sylvain Attal. I will moderate. I'm, I'm co moderating with you. And I'm a journalist and I'm a, a co founder of Jamais Sans Elle also. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I think what we'll do is we'll start with some perspectives from um, activists or civil society groups working um, in, in India and in Pakistan um, to uh, address issues of gender violence online and, and other issues related to gender disparity, um, to share some views on, on the challenges and then, and then perhaps we can have, because we have a representative from Facebook here, Anki, you can respond to how pri some private sector actors are trying to address these very complex and difficult problems. So um, it, we can start with Asad on, on you, in, yes. And um, can I please be strict and give you three minutes only? I will warn you when we're coming to the end of that. I'll uh, try to finish in two and a half because we have uh, quite a lot of panelists and it's, I, I want to be an inclusive discussion. So very quickly, I'm a journalist primarily. Um, and like I said, one of the things that we have found ourselves is this research into online participation methods. We very recently started this new uh, uh, journal or um, a website. It's called Trends Monitor. And what we do is we try and assess political hashtags in Pakistan and see the participation or kind of try and assess the nature of the participation. We've recently found out that uh, the political hashtags are kind of overflowed by, um, uh, by, by fake accounts. And uh, these fake accounts essentially are used to, in one way or another, create a certain political narrative, uh, be it from one political party or another, or even the forces who are working against the political discussion in Pakistan. 
And so this has led to a belief, and, and by the way, this whole, uh, this, this whole exercise is specially focused on targeting A, women journalists online, B, women politicians online, and C, anybody who uh, talks about generally in a very progressive manner about politics in Pakistan. So we have found out that this, uh, it, it's very easy to actually hijack a certain discussion online, on Twitter, Facebook, or to create a narrative online. And, uh, you know, we've been also able to generate some evidence for it. Now, the question for us is, which is uh, an open question I'm going to leave uh, for this uh, discussion today. What do we do about it? One way of going about, which is a popular, um, you know, which is a popular sort of solution in Pakistan, India, and I'm sure most South Asian countries, is let the government take over this. Let the government handle this. Now, we've seen in countries like Pakistan that, that when the government steps in, they come in with a very strong regulatory mechanisms. And often these mechanisms are used in any way possible against people who are politically uh, expressing themselves online and so on. So then government doing something about this clearly is out of question. Then what then we do about it? The only, uh, the only sort of reasonable way that we have, or it, uh, again, this is something that we need to open for the discussion here. The only reasonable way is that we uh, we encourage the platforms to do something about it. But then who is going to make the, accounts, uh, make the platforms accountable? Who is going to ask questions when it comes to uh, big data, for instance, or privacy issues? Then there is a role of civil society organizations, such as ours in Pakistan, which we see that need, they need to be strengthened. And they need to perhaps work in tandem with, uh, with groups like Facebook and Twitter to make sure that the, there is a certain amount of um, uh, encouragement happening for these groups. So I'll just stop here. And like I said, it's um, you know, more than um, uh, instead of uh, having answers, I have questions for the panel. And I'll be happy uh, to sort of, you know, contribute to whatever discussion which happens. Thank you. Well, thank you, Asad. And from what I understood that you said there, the, the problem or the challenge, uh, to put it simply, is that online spaces um, can be easily hijacked or made non-inclusive or exclusive, depending on perhaps traditional power dynamics within society that are reflected then online. Um, and that means that this, this technology, which is, was meant to empower and um, bring, give people a voice, ends up not doing that. Um, and in particular, you're talking about political discussions in Pakistan and them being very difficult for women to get involved in because they're pushed, pushed out. Um, so maybe we can turn to you, Bishak. Is that a similar experience in, in India or, or is there a different dynamic there at play? Well, <clears throat> I wanted to actually talk about a group of young women in India who are between the ages of, say, you know, 16 to about 21 and who come from low-income families. And what we are finding actually is that the policy and the public discourse around access focuses very much on getting everybody online, but then it stops there. And what we are seeing is actually in these families, which are low-income families and their phones are shared, right? So these are all um, people who are using, who are mobile first. They're very rarely turning to laptops or tablets or uh, desktops. Their whole interaction online is through mobile phones. The, what is happening more and more is that there is a real distinction between the kind of access that young women are being given to the internet and young men. So if there's a family where there's a brother and a sister, you know, the girl, and it's a shared family phone, the girl gets much less, the young woman gets much less time on the phone. She's constantly questioned, like every hour, like, well, who are you talking to? So it's sort of becoming like a way to monitor her activities and sort of surveil her in a family sense. Um, so I think what we really want to talk about is that it's not enough for us to think about access and political participation, you know, sort of till the person gets access. We really have to think about how different genders are using the internet and what freedoms they are being given. And I want us to think beyond online violence. I think so much of the discussion is just around online violence, but what about the day-to-day -day discrimination, the day-to-day -day freedoms that women have to use the internet is, um, something that we feel is really something that needs to come into the policy discussion. So really talking about restricted access, restricted use, 
what is meaningful access? You know, what is the freedom to um, use the internet in these kinds of settings? Great, thank you, Bishaka. That, I think that's really interesting um, because it is such a much more nuanced discussion of access than we normally hear, which about the multiple barriers or, or the, the multiple challenges that, um, that women can face um, due to traditional societal community um, roles that they play and how that's reflected online and, and as you say whatever their solutions are we'll have to be sensitive to to that um, so before we we go to Jama Sanzel for the kind of discussion of a different context altogether um, a different approach um, I was wondering if you Anki have any um, any reflections on what Facebook um, or particular perhaps more generally the private sector um, can do and should be doing as well as what they are doing to address this fact that there are multiple barriers um, and, and what does it mean to really provide meaningful access that's empowering for women and what role can the private sector do to ensure that? Yes, yeah, so I think building on what Bishaka just said, I, but the biggest barriers for women getting, there are different types of barriers. But if you look at uh, the mass segment, this is of course a mobile first generation, and at least in our region what we are seeing, uh, there is a, a primacy in terms of local language content to be available on the internet, but mostly the fight is about access to resources in our societies, right? Because there is huge amount of cornering of resources. If you buy a data plan, you will give it to the boy and not to the girl in the family. So there's those traditional access barriers are there. It is fueled by normative uh, concerns, considerations, which again, you know, a combination of both economic and social reasons. Uh, in order to uh, sort of alleviate some of these problems, what I think the private sector is doing, Facebook definitely is making a lot of effort in that area, is that we're investing a lot in terms of digital literacy and uh, safety training. Uh, making sure that people understand how to keep themselves safe online and what are the kind of uh, hygiene practices which uh, uh, you know young people must follow online and there's a concerted effort across the board uh, good linking of arms uh, by the internet sector in terms of making sure that local language content and digital literacy material is available that's one part the second point is essentially what Asa talked about which is a range of um, uh, you know targeting of women who are active in public life or just have a big public voice whether in media or politics and <clears throat> making sure that they are not subjected to online hate speech so there are a whole lot of activities which we as Facebook are taking in terms of implementing our community standards strictly uh, making sure that we have a trusted flaggers network in our region where our partners from civil society are flagging these incidents to us and then we are enforcing against types of hate speech which target women also there are various kinds of signals which we read in terms of understanding um, what are fake accounts and what are the activities which they're doing on the platform and systematically then there's enforcement to take down fake accounts from our platform which is facebook because as you know we are uh, vectored on authentic identity so you have to represent yourself when you're on the platform and that a combination of all of these tactics in terms of local community engagement as well as um, sort of being very particular in terms of enforcing our community standards has helped us in creating some kind of a protective gear to prevent women from getting uh, attacked online thank you um, and I'm sure there are also challenges with implementing some of those approaches. Maybe we'll hear a bit more about that later on. But before that, I would like to move to Jamé Sanzel, some of the representatives from that, and we will come back to you. Thank you, <laughs> of course. Um, as I told you, uh, Jamé Sanzel was founded by uh, a community of men, I mean men, uh, all coming from the digital economy or entrepreneurs or journalists or whatever. Uh, and our primary field was France, of course, but then it evolved rapidly towards other actions beside, you know, just not participating to... It's, it's, it's very difficult to speak with noise because we don't have mics. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and... Okay, so... Um, it, it evolved in a second... 
series of uh, actions elsewhere than France. And first, uh, intervention by Sacha Kestian Semeon will explain you in a few words what, how Jamais Sans Elle evolved within these two years. Thank you, Sylvain. Thank you. Um, we are working um, on improving the presence and, um, and the commitment of women in every stage of the, uh, and every level of the society, because it's not a question here, I think, to say that there are not many women at high levels position and decision making and policy making around the world. And um, this is, we are talking about half the population of the world, so it's it's not normal. But the, what we are um, promoting at Jamais Sans Elle, it's a pledge that uh, mainly men are, are started to sing because um, we, this is a voluntary um, approach. Uh, we we do, do not seek uh, people to sign our, our pledge. That's the, the men themselves that, that uh, commit to the, this pledge. I will read it because it's very uh, short and straightforward. Um, there are too many panels, panels, discussions, round tables, experts, committees, or too many councils, meetings, and debating societies without women. From now on, we will no longer participate in any public media events at which topics relating to issues of common interest, society, politics, economics, science, and strategic matters, and debated, commented on, or assessed, and where there is no woman present among the many participants. That's the base of our, our commitment. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, because when there's not many women on panels, it's because what? Because event organizers or uh, generally the society doesn't seek for women at high position or at key position. And if they are, uh, they are not seeking for them, that there are not many at high position. And if there are not many at high position, it's because there is a um, a uh, hiring decision or a hiring uh, uh, process that isn't um, that aren't uh, adapted to this kind of uh, of uh, issues, and uh, in the tech realm, uh, which uh, which our expertise too uh, as a professional in uh, in this area, um, there are not uh, enough women. There are 30 percent women worldwide in the tech industry, that's not enough. At, at high position and, uh, and key roles, that's even less than that. And um, we are, uh, the, this is big, why uh, uh, Sophie and uh, Isabella are here too, to speak about the education uh, system and how we can um, improve the participation and the, um, of girls and women in STEM studies. And that, that's uh, actually the, the goal of Jamais Sans Elle, is to improve the um, participation globally of women. Yeah. And thank, uh, thank also you, to, just to, to say that we have been selected as, um, as the French delegate for the Women 20, uh, which uh, is one of the seven commitment groups that must suggest an analyst and put forward a recommendation for the 28 uh, uh, G20 Buenos Aires Summit, and we've um, worked with the International Co Committee to propose um, three recommendations on access for uh, women in rural areas, uh, financial uh, inclusion, digital inclusion, and participation in um, uh, technical development uh, regard, um, regarding, uh, for example, um, gender biases in uh, artificial intelligence. That's a part of the work we're, that we are doing um, uh, um, uh, on the side of the, the pledge. Thank you, Sasha, for explaining how a simple commitment turned into a real broader uh, engagement in favor of gender diversity. Sophie, maybe yes. can you explain how Ecole 42 is helping to uh, uh, promote uh, women's empowerment in tech industry specifically? Uh, well, thank you. Well, not, um, well, I will try, but not only for women, but also for diversity. Mm -hmm. So uh, 42 is the first completely free computer training courses. It's open to all uh, and accessible to 18 to 30 years old. It's um, a school where there is no degree requirement, there is no tuition fees, so this is completely free. And uh, the selection is made only to detect IT talents regardless any school background and any <coughs> social background. 
So the school is open 24 hours on seven days, and it implements the principles of open education, but go further by developing a system on self-education, and the system is named peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, so at first there is no lecture, there is no teacher, we do not uh, have any online lecture or something like that. So um, students are facing software development challenge and they need to create pieces of software. So to do this, they, the job they, they, they will be to, to gather and collect information, to test and verify, to discuss, uh, to uh, see if information is important or not, relevant or not, etc., etc. Um, and usually they can't do this alone, so they will need to collaborate. That's why uh, we call it peer learning. And um, students develop um, IT technical skills, but also adaptation, problem solving, collaboration, critical thinking, self-learning, creativity, diversity handling, and agile state of mind to state the unknown. <coughs> so we have for now 4,200 students in Paris and 800 students in uh, the Silicon Valley. So in US, where you know studies are very expensive and blocking the way for many individuals to receive an education and find a well-paid job, which is easy in IT because, uh, you know, there is a lack of, uh, of talent. And um, for conclusion, we have uh, two more times internships offer and job offer than our number of students. We have outstanding evaluation from companies and often career start before 42 certificates. So this is a real success. But, and there is a but, uh, we have only 15% of girls. And I think this is the same um, in all, the, um, all the, the computer engineering schools, as uh, Isabel could say also. Okay, and, and th something important, 42 is free? Yes, completely free. Okay. You mentioned it? Did yes, you mention it? Oh, okay. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> no uh, um, Isabel, you're, a, you're a directing a chair on the future of work at the CNAM. I'm not sure that everybody here knows what's the CNAM. The CNAM is an in engineer school. Not only. Not only. Uh, not only. It's, a uh, it's the largest French university and one, one of the oldest, uh, not compared to the Sorbonne, but uh, and we have a lot of tech students, 30 percent of students are, tech, are, are for tech. So, but my point is not to talk about my school, my point is to talk about my experience. Um, I joined the internet in 1996. In that time, we were not so few women because there is not so much women. We were only a few people doing this conversa online conversation. I had a great hope uh, uh, at that time. I thought that because we were all starting a new technology, we would be equal. But in fact, it did not happen. It did not happen, and I don't know why. I don't know why men take the lead on the internet, and we were step back. We were uh, not as visible. We, do, we had less voice and whatever. People now explain to me it's because women do not, do not choose to go to tech school so they are not building the internet they are not building but building is not the voice so I still do, do not understand why women are not so <coughs> on the internet it's maybe because women have a perception of the world uh, a bit different from, from men I don't say it's from your both, but I say um, you could have a different perception because your place in the world is uh, given by your birth is not the same. So now internet is a man world. And as you know, the man world are never safe for women. There's another mov movement called Me Too. And this movement's movement show us that every woman in life face a dangerous situation. So when you decide to go online in a man world, you decide to face our situation. You, have, you decide to face harassment online. So if you want to, to, to develop the, the, the number of women going on online, you have to protect them online. You have to, to make policy who protect from harassment, for, who protect from insults and things like that. So the first thing for me, if you want women, you need a safe world because if this world is not safe, women will never join the conversation. The second point, always with, everybody always told me, you are not competitive enough. Men are more competitive than you. They want to success more than you. Okay, 
That's right. If you see in France, there is a, the World Cup, the World Cup for football. The World Cup is even every four years, you join the World Cup, you go to bar, you support your team, your national team, it's all about men, only men. So the, our national heroes this year are all men, that's all. So we value a lot this kind of competition in our country. Even if we support women to success, we value more uh, conquest sport than artistic sport, for example. And the third thing, it's very difficult for, for women to, f to find allies. It's very difficult because in this world, there is not so much women. So you can make a, a team with other women. You have to make a team with men. And that's the point with Jamais Sans Elle. Some men take the risk to support women. They have no obligation to support women. They, have, they, they do not need that for success. But they say, this world will not be the same without any woman. And that's why they decide to, to take the risk to say, I will not attend a, con a conference if there is no woman at the table. And sometimes it causes trouble. I remember some meetings that just called me two hours before, could you join the, the, the conference? Because there is no woman. If, if there is no woman, the conference will not happen. It's why, it's why I'm invited at the moment. It's because I'm the only woman who could speak about something that is only men who could speak about in the mind of the others. That was my point. Thank you. I should have mentioned that there's a, something a little bit difficult to understand is why girls are doing particularly well in high school, in math, in science. So they're competitive. And there there's a problem that because there are too few of them are accessing science and math or engineer school in the, after, after high school? Why, why uh, uh, yeah. uh, maybe it's because of the education, it's because maybe, well, what, I, what I, s I, s I know about uh, mm -hmm. the girl who joined our uh, engineer school, the, uh, first to, before to join, they are afraid to join the men world. There is 80, 85 percent, mm -hmm. uh, even 90 percent of the students were men. They knew they would be harassed in school, they know it. Every engineer school has to face that. And because it's dangerous, it se it sexual, sexual insult, whatever. Whatever. Misogyny. You are not. You are, you are, pardon? Misogyny. Okay. Yeah, misogyny. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So you, you must be very courageous to do that. So, so courageous because you know the, the men will not accept you. It's not they do not, but you know that it's. it's is they act like tribe. So, uh, in video games, it's obvious. You do on video games platform, it's men driven. It's horrible the way they see women. And if for, if for a young girl, if who like to play video games, she could not imagine she could join a school where you learn to code, because the environment is like in a video game. Yeah. We may, um, sure, we, we still have another panelist um, to provide her perspectives. Oh, and I just wanted to ask you, because you've heard now um, uh, different perspectives on the challenges to inclusive access and what it means to be able to um, use the internet as a woman or to be able to participate in these discussions in a way that is, um, that is really inclusive and, and that's you know, very challenging for a number of different reasons, including misogyny, including um, uh, you know, unequal power relations more generally um, so that women don't feel safe online. But you also heard some responses for how that can be challenged through campaigns like Jamais Sans Elle and the work that you're doing even at the G20 and also through education, um, including supporting further education in science and technology. Are these solutions or ways that you think would work, things that would work in Egypt? Or, and what are the particular challenges? So first, I have a comment for my colleagues for, uh, from Jami Zonzel. Actually, the African IGF, which, which was held last week uh, in Khartoum, had many several panels, which are all men panels. So, yeah, if you can cooperate with them to, to decrease that. Um, uh, okay, so I'm um, echoing uh, the previous panelists, and thank you for uh, your interventions. Um, when it comes to women in technology, we have some sort of filtration. Um, in many cultures, uh, women are being told that uh, STEM education is not for you. It's, for, it's a man thing. Like, uh, if, 
they, they, they grow up with this perception, even if they have a bug in their phone, they will give it to the man uh, in ho at their home. Uh, so that's the first uh, filtration pro uh, phase. And then uh, even uh, when they are um, engineers or technologists, um, they may give up their career and just prioritize their family life. So we end up with a lack of expertise from women and with very few talented women in the market. And that's not like... Um, a regional perspective, I think it, it happens in many countries, not only in, G in Egypt. Uh, but um, I'm seeing many uh, initiatives to, to bring more women in tech, uh, to bring like more women in cybersecurity or AI or different um, uh, emerging technologies. Um, I'm bringing one example on why we need women uh, in engineering and in design. Um, actually, I heard that example in the last IGF. Uh, there was a woman who happened to be a doctor, and she was um, a member in a gym, and there, is, uh, there was uh, specific hours for women. So when she swiped her card to enter the gym, the access was denied because the title was a doctor, and the system translated a doctor as being a man, not a woman. <laughs> so, that's an example. We need to have ethics when it comes to design and engineering. Um, I'm talking from my own experience because um, I'm an engineer and I work for several corporates for now. Um, women are given um, um, office-based jobs mainly, not uh, field jobs or implementation and deploy jobs or even design jobs. And we don't see many women in the top management of ICTs. And that's, a, that's an issue because we don't see women in decision-making um, uh, dialogues and, and when it comes to private sector. Um, um, I will, I will t uh, talk about uh, some initiatives at Dell. Um, we have a community uh, at Dell co called Women in Action. It's for the employees. It provides uh, women-to-women mentorship and activities for women at the corporate. It's, it's not based in Egypt. It's a global community within Dell, so you will see uh, the same community in um, other offices for Dell. And we have um, um, a team called the University Relations Team, uh, which works with um, university students and professors. We offer technical um, courses for uh, students and we even organized um, some graduation project uh, competitions and last year the winning team was an all-women team so that's a great thing and um, it, it, it need like a, it's a continuous process of improvement if we have um, more women in tech we'll get a safer internet we will get a more inclusive internet thank you Right, thank you for, for sharing your perspectives and also some concrete examples of how things can change. Um, so I wanted to ask if any of the panelists want to respond to any of the points that were made by other panelists. Otherwise, we can, we can open up to the, um, to the rest of the, well, to the audience, to everyone else who's here. Shaka. I just wanted to make a small point, which is that I largely agree with everything that's been said. But I think one of the other issues that we're finding with women's participation in online spaces is that many women, because they've been told that technology is not for you or technology is for you in a very limited sense, actually don't feel a sense of belonging in this space. So I would actually say that along with safety, which is very important, that first women have to feel like they belong in this space, right? And again, I'm not necessarily talking about women who are in this room, who might feel a sense of belonging, but really many women who come from lower income families, et cetera, right? Um, who anyway are not being given this technology. So we are finding in our workshops in India that before we go to some of the issues like safety, 
violence, harassment, all of which are very, very important, that first we have to sort of somehow explain that you are not a bystander in this place. You also belong here. This space is also for you, and we are seeing this also on a lot of WhatsApp groups, because WhatsApp is the most popular social media platform in India. Um, is like, for instance, if there are groups of journalists, not in English, but say in other local languages, and say there's a WhatsApp group with many more male journalists and a few female journalists, often the women will just not say anything in that group. So they're always just listening or, you know, like bystanders or witnesses, but they're not like active participants in that space. So I feel we need to think about that also as part of the whole sort of big gender picture. Absolutely, and uh, I wonder if there's anyone in the audience who has um, experience of that as well? or ideas or is part of um, trying to bring solutions to ensuring that women in particularly low income um, settings feel like the internet's for them and it's, it's not just interesting or, or whatever, it's actually really going to help them with what they would like to achieve in their lives and, and be a tool for them. Yes. Um, uh, an excellent discussion, so I congratulate you all on that. A point on why girls do not uh, join STEM education is also because of textbooks, because of the way that the textbooks have been written, especially mathematics and science textbooks. Uh, they are written uh, in a way that uh, they are more biased towards the male lens. And uh, women are often verbal learners, and men are spatial learners. And these books are written in a more spatial way, whereas uh, it, when it should, be, should have been written to cater to uh, you know a gender equal audience, these books were created a long time back, and uh, we need to reform the education system in terms of textbooks <coughs> as well. Um, uh, another point uh, that Ma'am uh, was talking about is very relevant in India. I work with young girls in India, and I wanted to ask. I had a question that how do you um, ensure that uh, you know these women don't feel uh, these young girls don't feel that they are bystanders. Because I often feel that uh, because women are not respected in political discussions, like you see the drawing room discussions that we have in India, a woman often is not allowed to or not, or their perspective is not entertained and often ridiculed even. Um, so how do you step, uh, personally I've experienced this uh, within my family as well, which is a very educated family, where when I spoke about my feminist views, I was told <coughs> that um, this might create problems in your future. And I presume it was about getting married to a man. <laughs> Obviously, I'd like to get married to someone who's uh, not sexist, but um, so how do you, how do you um, ensure that uh, at a very young age we are able to step in and sort of you know, inject that uh, drive of gender equality? Maybe that's a question for you, Vishaka, but also I was wondering if you think that movements or campaigns or initiatives like Jamais Sans Elle or those kind of voluntary bottom-up approaches could provide um, not a solution but be part of the solution in absolutely. context like India. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think what you've asked is a really relevant question and I think it goes, the answer goes beyond technology, right? So we have to start at a young age by ensuring that girls feel public spaces are for them and that they can participate in public discussions in political act, you know discussions etc because otherwise what happens is all you know say till the age of 14 this girl has been told no you can't this public space is not for you you have to stay in the home etc it's very difficult then when your formative lessons are like this to suddenly change it when the mobile phone comes, right? But at the same time, I will say that just like the experiences you all shared, we are also seeing in India that you can start the empowerment process with technology or with the mobile phone, right? And that itself can trigger off sort of empowerment offline as well. So it works both ways, yeah. And, and do you think a jamais sans elle movement would work in India? Do you think men would take up the mantle of saying we wouldn't go to any panels without women or similar initiatives? Do you think that would take off or is the time not 
quite right, yeah. I think it would take okay. off. Why not? <laughs> because I think increasingly, like in India also, we have a, you know, on Twitter, there's been a lot of conversation about particularly technology conferences where it's assumed that only men have the expertise to talk. And there's actually a list online talking about, um, you know, women and other genders who can participate in these panels, etc. So I think this is very much a consideration in India. And I also want to say that in the same way that, you know, Me Too is a for force at the global level, over the last couple of months, we've had a very, very big Me Too India movement where women are questioning sexism, misogyny, sexual harassment, etc. So I think, you know, also in a, in a connected world, you learn from each other. You see things that work in other countries and you say, hey, maybe I, we can do this in our country as well. Yeah. So, there is another mo yes. movement, uh, mm -hmm. it's not movement, but it's another habit that women have now in uh, offices, is when uh, you are interrupted by a man, another woman takes a voice and interrupts the man and, like, and give back the, 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 to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the woman who was who who speaking first. That's, that's a good way, and it's starting in the, in the white hall. So it's what you said, uh, you have experience in, in the world and you can uh, have in your own countries, and you could import. Yeah, great. I think there are a number of different examples, and it's great to have these conversations because you you either learn of them or you're reminded of them. And um, yes, I will come to you. Sir. Yeah, I, I would like to add something okay. about the the panel, mm -hmm. um, which is called "How Can ICT um, uh, Makes the World More Human?" This is about humanism. We are talking about how to live together how to work together, how to uh, have a better participation of women and, and, and minorities <coughs> visible or not. That's not the question, that for a better living together. And um, I think we need um, a change of mindset, a global change of mindset uh, about uh, uh, many topics, but um, <laughs> around the world because we have a lot of problems. But <laughs> gender diversity and gender equality is one uh, that we can act together, not only men taking participation of it, but working uh, with women. We have a, a women's council in, a, in our organization also. Uh, uh, entrepreneurs, um, uh, executives uh, uh, from uh, companies, we are working with, uh, directly with enterprises that, um, and companies that, uh, to implement uh, internal and external uh, charter of conduct and guidelines to uh, have better uh, hiring processes, uh, better uh, career um, uh, promotions, etc. And um, yeah, we are yeah. looking now with uh, for a month. Or maybe or you so. can say a word of your partnership with Microsoft. It would be interesting, maybe. Yeah, yeah we are working with Microsoft France on this. Uh, we've written with, with them a charter for um, uh, that uh, they say that they, it's, it's basically the same. They will not organize or take um, um, participation in any panels or event without women. That is uh, internal uh, meetings or external or even there, uh, there, there is a female presence at their um, client meetings. Uh, that's, I think the, the, that's the one of the uh, um, action that we can take with the enterprises. We have also um, about uh, 30 ambassadors and French consuls around the world that took the pledge, men and women, no? that, that's a, a mix. And as long as um, uh, 50 uh, members of parliament and senators. But I would like to add something that we need to mentor young boys too. Yeah. That's, that's uh, we need to monitor everybody on this on this topic because we have to, as boys, we have to uh, learn how to live together. That's what I said before. And we are not diff you are not special on any manner. We are different, but we are part of the same world. We are building the same thing. We are living together, and that's the the thing. That's that's um, uh, our um, our mindset is humanist, humanistic, actually. So it's to improve the, the, the life and the, and the world, actually. I think maybe, maybe Sophie can, can, yes. can say a word. And we have a question. Yes. Yes. Ah, okay. 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 Yeah, go ahead. Okay.
three uh, law students. Um, I am working with the UN Women Arab States uh, on a project which is called Gender Innovation. from Morocco, from a conservative family, and going through many experiences in this field, I have learned that we cannot wait for all these you know, biased ideologies to end so that girls and women can take a step further. No, we cannot do this. And we cannot wait for, for young boys or for uh, you know, brothers, uh, fathers, or whatever, to take a step, a step further. I think we need to give more visibility to women. We were so, talking about this yesterday, like for the Nobel Prize winner, she got a Wikipedia page just after, right after she got the Nobel Prize winner. Although <coughs> she was doing a very great job, but she wasn't visible on the, on the online space, and we couldn't hear from her. We couldn't see her fight, and we couldn't get inspired. There are many super girls all over the world, many Malalas, many fighters, but they are not visible. And I think we need to give them a chance to speak up. And we need to, to, to show that you can come from a low uh, income family, you can come from the global south, you can come from wherever you, you come, and you can do a great job. Because it's up to you. Thank you. Thank we, we, you. I think we, we're here today to, in, to uh, envisage solutions. So mm -hmm. how, how do we do that, for example? If someone has ideas in, t in terms of improvement mm -hmm. from the so civil society or from government, from NGO, etc., how do we do it in practice? How do we do to, to have this improvement and make that, for example, this Nobel Prize, for example, the, 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 the further Nobel Prize, if she's a woman, she will have a, a Wikipedia notice before having a, a, a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. I have a comment. Okay. Yes, thanks. Norma. So I believe that female experts need to be content creators. Okay, Fem uh, women are not really good with with marketing their themselves or, or their success. But uh, I can't believe that. <laughs> really, <laughs> no, they 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 don't cr take credit for their work. So sure. women need to take credit for their work and market for it and and create content about it. So if she's she the, the, the Nobel Prize winner needed to market for herself or for her work before even winning, and that that uh, when will uh, women uh, feel belong to this online space and will feel s safe when they come online? Thank you. Uh, so we've got two, two questions, I think three. Um, We'll take them one by one, but I think the question that you asked about what are some solutions and what are the roles of different stakeholders in a, addressing these issues, like we've heard quite a few initiatives that um, some private actors have taken, like Microsoft, to hi changing hiring processes or signing up to charters. Blah, blah, blah. So those are some examples, and if you can think of or share any others, that would be really interesting to hear as well. So we'll take your question, your question, and then um, your question. So, yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. Um, it's not, my name is Nicole Peter Patterson, and I am from the Caribbean. She leads it, and also related with an NGO, Women's Economic Imperative. In response to what can be done, exactly as the colleague from um, India Youth Group was speaking about, and we were speaking about it yesterday, one of some of what we've been doing in the Caribbean region, very small compared to a lot of the, the other um, regions here, is engaging girls in hackathons so this is as and that gets them in that space the girls that we're speaking about are girls in the senior level of high school and in university so those who would be moving to go into that pipeline to go into the industry of course we need to be doing it much earlier in terms of their engagement in stem as well but what that has done is that has built a and this is only we've only been doing it for two years so far and that has built 
and um, a wave of them as content creators. And even out of that, we have um, one school in Trinidad and Tobago specifically that has developed two initiatives, mobile apps actually. Um, one is in response to gender-based violence and the other one is in response to, you know, um, one is GBV and the other one is in terms of cyberbullying. Cyber Both of them have attracted the attention of the Inter-American Development Bank and Microsoft in the region. So I think the key thing is the STEM engagement, but not more than STEM just in the textbooks, but engaging the girls in addition to the fact that the boys are already there in hands-on type initiatives. I think that's where we're seeing that there is a significant difference. And um, we're doing it with the, with the ITU, International Telecoms Union Equals Program as well. So hopefully through that, what we're hoping is that that will push out across the LAC region and otherwise with UN Women. Thank you very much for sharing those experiences. And we have also comment or question from there. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you all panelists for your insights. Uh, my name is Lois and I come from Uganda. I'll briefly talk about like, uh, online participation, like some of the panelists have already mentioned. So when we talk about women's online participation, I think we should not only look at like women from low income uh, uh, families or even countries, it cuts across. I'll talk briefly about our work in Uganda. We on uh, Women at Web, where we're trying to find out how women participate in online spaces. And we interacted with the women who are active online journalists, and the experience was really not good. One journalist said, she's a vocal one, she said, for me, I don't Google myself. Because she knows that there is a lot of negative uh, talk, and that limits our participation. Then another vocal one said, for me, when I go online, it's war, because she knows the backlash. So those are the dynamics in online spaces. And one of the issues that came out, and they were wondering, how do we build that online social support so that women are not pushed offline, are not pushed to offline spaces? Not only the, those who, do, who can't afford, there are those who can, who can afford, and they have the platform, and they have the capability but the dynamics there are forced, have forced them to go offline, especially women politicians, journalists, or any, any vocal woman who would want to engage substantively online. They are forced to go offline because of the negativity, the toxic nature of online engagements. So how do we garner that support through uh, uh, different uh, methodologies and, uh, and coalitions to make sure that women who have at least owned the space, who have tried to belong to the space, as you have mentioned, are not uh, gagged, are not uh, being forced to go away. Even the little uh, knowledge or the little space they have gained cannot be taken away from them. Yeah, that was my uh, either comment or a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, she's Aaron from Uganda. I'm part of the Media Legal Defense Initiative on this conference. Um, I want to contribute to the solutions that were asked. I think one of the ways that uh, this problem can be overcome of women participation is we need like in private initiative organizations that are actually in the defense of women interests online. For example, what about a platform that creates digital pages, the, I mean something like a Wikipedia, but f mainly for women who are extraordinary across regions and across countries because it's not good to depend on the goodwill of people who may not be women or who may not be interested in women affairs to create those pages. So if those pages are created, those platforms are created, then people will learn about their existence sooner and more women will be inspired. What about having a prat an organization that 
for example, the achievements of women which are recorded on, on Facebook are sponsored Facebook. The, I heard of a Facebook person here. They have this sponsorship form. Can we have some organization that actually sponsors them? And that also being done across Twitter, across all social media. How can we optimize women's voices? And also my, uh, my, my friend from Uganda was talking about women being gay. That's very true. We need to understand the nature of attacks against women. You have seen nude pictures of some women, like singers in our area, leaking. That's for some women that will hold the back from their participation. Can we have uh, dedicated organization mounting suits against people who do, 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 do those leakages? Can we have people whose law is basically to respond on behalf of some, some women who may be meek, others are very vocal. But for those who cannot, who are either meek and are not willing to defend themselves, can we have people who can gather facts and m come to the defense, both online and non-online defense? of women who are under attack. Because the fact is that as long as these attacks against women participation, the few women who are participating in these online platforms are not being answered, then it has a chilling and a snowball effect against the, it disincentivizes the participation of other women. Yes, absolutely. And um, would you like to react to yeah. some of the points that yeah, were made yeah, about? I just want to tell to everyone, I have the feeling we have tried all the solutions to, to improve the visibility, to improve the access to women to, to uh, tech studies and whatever. But only the law could help really women to go online because we, we, we have to clarify in law what is online intimidation. We have to, to, to protect them when they show herself. Um, first, uh, the French first lady is facing a lot of hate when she's going out and uh, when she's speaking online and and this is, and she is the first lady could you imagine younger girl uh, uh, political uh, political less protect it's impossible to be visible if you are uh, under uh, an attack online the problem is how, how do you react because you have the problem of anonymity, you have proxies, you, find you have... You are helped by Microsoft, by, uh, by Twitter, by Facebook, you make alliance for that and uh, you do uh, uh, a cause. Closure of people who are offending women rights. There should be a, a, a neutral third party that authorizes, it could be a court that if there is an anonymous attack on a woman, then that, that the anonymity should be broken into. Of course, like every right, there must be limitations as long as they are necessary and proportionate, and I think that would be a very necessary ground for limiting anonymity. Yeah. I don't know if yes, yes. Um, yeah, okay. we, we, I think the, the, co the conversation has interestingly turned from what can private actors do and what role does education have to play to what are some of the um, legal and regulatory frameworks that are conducive to supporting yes. uh, women online. Um, and so if anyone has any um, reflections on that, that uh, would be Sophie, good. Sophie had yeah. something to say because and then we'll on, to uh, on a yeah. previous school, she managed to have a, a woman-driven, let's say, uh, um, okay. alumni. 80% oh, no. women, no, no it was not? not alumni, no. no. Well, I will try it in okay, English, okay, sorry. Try, okay. just, just one thing, I wanted to be positive, because uh, things are changing a little. Well, I think I'm leading one of the biggest uh, computer science school in France, which is really, really not usual, so I'm very proud to be one of the first. And if you put a girl leading school, in fact, that changed things, because the first thing I did in my school, that was to be concerned about how girls um, will be welcome in the mm. schools. And so um, um, the school before, I, uh, you know, just Isabel was true, because one thing very important is girls doesn't want to go in a school or in a place where there's only men, you know, they are really afraid about that. So you have to, to change these things. And it is very simple just to say to girls, so we save a place for you. And you mean quotas, for example? Yes, 
Go tough. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Some people are not uh, agree are not with that, but uh, I think it's a good thing. Um, in 42. Just like we did in politics in France, for example, we had to do. Yeah, but um, well, in, in the school in 42, we have um, uh, how you said. Uh, well, we have an, uh, you apply to the school, and then after you have online test, and th then after you can come to a um, conference collective. Yeah. Collective conference. Collective conference. I think something like that, and then. And after, you can have the, uh, the piscine. I don't know if you heard about that. It's an imme <laughs> imm immersion uh, period of four, four weeks. And after that, you can go in the school. So it's very, very hard. But I just uh, asked to my, to, my, um, to my staff to save, and I had, and I had a very, um, how to say, the, uh, communication on that, and said, for now, we are going to save 50% of the place of the collective conference for women. And just to say that, just to do that, so girls think, oh, okay, you're thinking about me, you are saving a place, so, and, and I won't be just a little minority. Because, you know, when you came in a place and you're the only girl, <laughs> if you said, okay, did I eat something wrong? Am I in the good place? Okay, so just this little thing. And before I, um, I start a, a session with 80 persons, of women, and just because they knew that there will be the majority, they came because they knew they can help each other and everything like that. So just sometimes do a little things just to save place and say, you're welcome. And also, because I lead the school, I say to all my staff, if I see only one time something like misogyny or something like this, <laughs> it's going to be a real problem for you. <laughs> and just that, right. is okay. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I think um, what, what that says is how important it is to have leaders and to have people in positions who can make decisions like that actually commit um, and basically put their foot down and say, um, you know, this, this is how it's going to be and it's go we're going to promote this policy and taking those actions is really important for, for making change. But Pishaka, you wanted to make a point. Very quickly, just three points. One is, I think I really feel like Me Too has shown us how to build a supportive community online, right? With each woman supporting another woman who's speaking out and tweeting on Facebook, on social media. But I want to say that this responsibility to create a welcoming space and a safe space where all genders can feel comfortable, the responsibility cannot only be on us as users. I really feel the platform has to take some responsibility. And I'm a part of the Wikipedia community. And when we realized at Wikipedia that there was a very big gender gap, and I was on the board at that time, we took a lot of steps which may not have all been perfect, but we acknowledged the problem. And we said, yes, we have to do something about it. So I don't think that Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, or any platform, big or small, can say, oh, we are just a platform. You know, and they all are the users, you all figure it out. I don't think that's acceptable at all. I think platforms have to take responsibility for this. And um, the other thing that I actually, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. Oh, anonymity. Sorry, that's what I wanted to say. You know, I, again, we work with a lot of people who are bisexual, gay, lesbian, trans, queer. And anonymity is really important because for many of the people we work with, they are not out to their families in offline spaces. And it's only because of online spaces that give them anonymity that they can build little communities. So I want to say that anonymity is a tool. It can be used for good and it can be used for bad. And I'm not comfortable with asking that we take away anonymity online. Yeah, thanks for that point, Bishak. And I think that's a really interesting point about anonymity is that it's actually how it's used as a tool is reflective of the broader structures in place and it, addressing those broader power um, inequalities is about much more than just um, attacking one tool or one instance of, of um, the tool being used in a specific way. So it's a much more complex issue and I think being aware of that is going to be important so that we don't actually end up harming the people we're really trying to support in the mean, in the, in the, um, in a, the attempts to address the issue. So we have two other questions, so I'll go with you first. Okay. Um, yeah, my name is Menno Etzma. I work for the Council of Europe in the Anti-Discrimination Department, and we are also behind the No Hate Speech Movement Youth Campaign, which was a 
to empower young people to speak up against hate speech. Our experience is we've, we've campaigned on sexist hate speech too, and we, our experience here is that hate speech, there's always a discussion around hate speech about freedom of expression or hate speech and et cetera and this whole gray area. I think what's interesting is how that debate about should things stay up or not really gets contaminated when it comes to when it comes to women or targeting women because then sexism and uh, sexual harassment and all these kind of things come in and then it becomes a much more uh, multi uh, multifaceted discussion and I think we do need to go back to this really splitting these two things I mean the discussion about is something f freedom of expression or hate speech that's one but as soon as sexism comes in it becomes something else and I think the Council of Europe's work through the Istanbul Convention on Sexual Violence and uh, Domestic Violence uh, also has some indications there on what could be done on addressing sexual harassment online, on sexism, and I think this should really be picked up through legislative uh, measures, and I think there are areas where you can say, okay, this is freedom of expression, but as soon as it's become sexism, it becomes something else, and I think we should also go back to the internet companies and to look into their assessment protocols, because we are in an ongoing discussion about what's hate speech and what's not, but I think it can be even sharper when it comes to hate speech targeting women because that is, that is a more complex situation. Uh, and I think many women in politics, for example, do not suffer hate speech as such as more sexist hate speech. And that's a very different type of animal. And I think we need to be here when it comes to gender equality. Let's also have gender equality in hate speech then. And that's be so crude. Yes, exactly, and it's really important to get those those questions right. Um, so we'll go. You, yes, and then we have questions. Sorry, we do have to wrap up in ten minutes, so I'm going to be aware of. A, a, yes, of course. All right, I'm going to try to be as concise as possible, and I'm happy I could follow up from this uh, this comment about uh, platforms taking responsibility. I, uh, my name is Emil. I work for. Danish Institute for Human Rights, and we do a lot of human rights impact assessments uh, in relation to, to companies in general, often more related to supply chains. Um, but I think just a week ago, Facebook came out with a report on how it um, were complicit in hate speech in uh, Myanmar uh, in relation to the Rohingya situation there. And I think, or actually it's more of a question to, to some of you here, maybe before we were talking about Pakistan, about the platforms, you were talking about platform responsibility and is that a way, obviously not a silver bullet, obviously it doesn't solve participation in itself, but it, what regards hate speech or sexist speech or misogyny on these platforms to actually have companies take their responsibility and do impact assessments. What is the impact on their platform? How does that affect women? We've been talking about in Uganda, anyone who comes online, we're talking about in France, uh, with, the, with the first lady even. Um, and do you think that is not a solution to solve it all, but that actually it should be instituted, that companies should actually in fact do human rights impact assessments and see what is the, um, you know, the, the, the consequences of my platform. Uh, and I would like particularly direct it to Pakistan and, and India, maybe then, um, if you have any responses to this. Great, so yes, we can, we can go straight to Asad. And then, uh, with, is that a, with actually, um, you know, we are talking about gender um, parity here, so maybe we should go to you first. Mine is so a sorry, brief Asad. intervention, thank you, about uh, just to complete from my colleague from the Council of Europe. I'm also from the Council of Europe, and I. I'm the head of gender equality there, and we are currently um, preparing a recommendation to our member states uh, on sexism and combating sexism, and it includes, the draft includes a section on the internet, and of course we want to be able to um, provide this text, it's, a, it's going to be unique text um, that addresses um, combating sexism, and uh, so we have a section on the internet, and we want to be able to uh, find the right balance, of course, uh, where the responsibility should be with uh, the governments in legislating in order to protect um, uh, spaces online for, for users um, uh, without, of course, stifling the free speech, which is the great potential also that the Internet represents. Um, and so, um, and I particularly also to find that balance so that responsibilities of, of um, of uh, private enterprise are duly um, taken into account so that they can operate but within certain lines that 
will um, respect dignity uh, for and encourage participation of, of girls and women. Uh, before we wrap Thank up, I, I'd like to, to bring the question of artificial intelligence. Yes. Excuse me, because it's really, it's really important, because we only have 10 minutes, just a few minutes with Sasha, because I think we, we've been talking about the present war, mm -hmm. but the next war uh, is artificial intelligence, and we're already seeing the gap, the gender gap in that field too. So Sasha wants to say a word about yeah, that. Yeah, we, we talked a little bit about the, the use of the technologies and the internet, and we have to put some ethics in how their tools, how the uh, networks, how the platform are built, and what is the intention, because everything is built by big companies and business-driven, like uh, Facebook or Amazon, etc. When Amazon use uh, AI algorithms in their um, hiring processes where uh, their uh, data s uh, sets are based, mm -hmm. they are not uh, seeing many women in the, um, in the um, jobs uh, offers because uh, the, the data sets were biased and we have to be uh, vigilant on this and how wh how we, we do we f how do we feed the machine mm -hmm. what what is the intention the yeah the machines uh, and, and pro uh, yeah not only ai but uh, on every process on building um, uh, infrastructure and platforms that's it's relevant for the what why we are here it's a, a question Absolutely. of governance Do you mean we are building we're building a male artificial intelligence right now yeah. a male uh, a male driven technologies yeah yeah. Great. Yeah. I, I think that the uh, so, thank you for for that intervention. And I think the um, example you gave now of, of um, a system not recognizing a doctor as a woman yeah. is one of many many examples. Yeah. Um, and and there needs to be a response um, that is is inclusive of women, which would you know allow for a sustainable long term mm -hmm. um, solution to this, this uh, issue. And ju just want to to add something that we are launching today a pledge. Um, aimed at the internet governance uh, organizations and um, uh, think tank, etc. We are singing today with uh, uh, Isaac France, uh, Reporters Without Borders, and uh, a think tank which is Renaissance Numérique. Uh, this is just the start at uh, internet governance organization and NGOs to say that we, they will not be uh, organizing uh, conferences or council on important uh, um, governance uh, project or uh, issues without any woman. We are launching it today. Great, and I, I'm, I'm sure there will be a lot of support for that and from everyone in this room. Um, but before we wrap up, and I, I can do a brief summary of the discussion so far, um, I'd like to go to Asset, and there was a question directed at you as well about whether or not you think that uh, intermediaries or platforms um, should adopt, for example, human uh, rights impact assessment. I'll just take one minute. I think the question for me to take away from this discussion today is are we building not just a male AI system, but also um, a, a primarily a system which, is, which does not see race or does not see ethnicity or does not see gender or did not, does not see any of the underlying uh, nuances which are, which are very common in society, local societies, communities, so on. One of the things I wanted to uh, just to quickly respond to your question, sir. One thing that we've recently seen in Pakistan is Twitter actively, and Facebook, of course, but I'll uh, uh, focus on Twitter here more. Twitter actively taking off some accounts um, in, in, a, in a political debate in Pakistan. It was a very heated, sort of religious, undertoned debate, which was calling um, for a lot of hate. But one thing that in, in discussions like this we usually tend to miss, generally, is not the hate speech, but the incitement to violence specifically. And in, in uh, online spaces, incitement to digital violence. There are many studies in Pakistan, I'm sure um, there are others as well, that we've seen that digital violence has a very, very high likelihood of getting converted into physical violence, especially if it's directed at women. And this is with what we've seen multiple times. About the impact assessment, this is a very interesting question for me as well, because there was this religious campaign uh, going on in Pakistan, which was actively inciting violence against some people. We saw that Twitter take off, took off the account of the lead person who was doing it. But then there were thousands of other fake accounts running and doing the same thing. And essentially, the trend which was trending, uh, the conversation which was happening, the violence which was being incited, remained there. So now the action is something that we need to uh, take care of. Was that action enough? Do we need to uh, sort of take a, a more stronger, sterner action? 
And if we do that, then what are the, uh, what are the boundaries that we need to uh, take care of? Are we then uh, saying in our conversations that the right to be anonymous should not exist? So this is the kind of balance that perhaps for me, uh, as, as a student, I, I'll sort of, you know, I'll, I'll uh, uh, try to learn more from this conversation. Okay. Um, we, are, we do have to end now. Um, we have two minutes left. Um, so I think that this conversation can definitely continue um, after, after the session, of course. And, uh, although we've heard so many of the challenges um, that are being faced, I think one thing that has come up for me is how similar some of these challenges are across different countries from Pakistan, India, Caribbean, um, even France, we're hearing uh, similar challenges, but also really interesting initiatives and ideas that could cross boundaries. Um, and I think what's also been interesting to hear is just the recognition of how the responsibility to address these issues so that women not only have access, they have meaningful access, they're content creators, they're designing and developing algorithms and all of that, that responsibility is going to fall on a number of different actors, and it does. Um, and there, to be specific, there were some examples of for human rights impact assessments for platforms or um, leaders taking a, a role in, you know, committing to having a certain number of women um, in positions of power, um, and grassroots campaigns, um, and then we heard a little bit about what Facebook is doing. Um, also regulatory responses, the Council of Europe, for example, I know that that's very specific, but you can, perhaps there's something that can be drawn from there for other regions. So I think there's, there are a lot of things that we can take away. Um, and I hope that this conversation uh, w will continue um, afterwards. And I just if I may add just one thing. Please, yeah, uh, take some time uh, The fact you. that this question of gender gap uh, in the science and tech environment is intimately linked to the, 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 the question of harassment online mm -hmm. and physical harassment. I think it was striking on the, the various uh, testimony we had, we had today. Absolutely. Um, so I'm sorry we couldn't take all the questions, but I think that just um, shows how interesting the conversation was and how engaging it was, well, hopefully, for all of you. Um, and so I'd like to thank all the panelists and also all of you for your participation. A quick round of applause for you. Thank you.
Um, unfortunately. Yeah, because we're starting late. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our workshop. Sorry, we're starting slightly late, but we're hoping that we can bring a speaker in um, remotely uh, in this session. So, fingers crossed that's all set up now. Um, this is workshop 139 on refugees, digital rights, necessities, and needs. I'm Ian Brown from Research ICT Africa. I'm a, um, I'll be the moderator. Uh, we have three speakers here um, who will give opening statements and hopefully our also remote speaker. But we want to make this inter as interactive um, as possible, of course. We've asked our speakers to stick to five to 10 minutes maximum so that we have at least half the time, hopefully, uh, to bring you all in and hear your perspectives. So I will very quickly introduce the, the four speakers and then I will hand the floor to them. Um, firstly, with an introduction and a short statement about the relevant legal framework, we have Mohamed Farahat here, uh, who's from African Civil Society on the Information Society. Um, we then will have his colleague, uh, Dr. Sise Kane, who is president of, of this organization, um, who will talk a bit more about general issues and access and perspective in coming years. Then on my left, we have Shan Hong Hu, who is a program specialist at UNESCO's Division of Freedom of Expression, Media Development, Communication and Information Society, who will talk about UNESCO's work on digital rights, um, digital literacy and gender mainstreaming. And then finally, hopefully, we'll have Dr. Aaron Martin from Tilburg University, who will talk um, about um, refugees and privacy issues, and in particular, around bio the use of biometrics and SIM registration and the resulting impact on access. So um, let's get going. Mohammed. Uh, <clears throat> let me first so thank you all of you to uh, participate in this session. Uh, and I hope you get perfect from the discussion. Uh, the first, I would like to speak about the importance of uh, refugees' digital rights and uh, the, main, uh, the main aim of this session uh, simply to shed the light of uh, the importance of bringing uh, the refugees' digital rights uh, to the IGF agenda. And uh, if, you check, if you check the uh, IGF agenda, you will find only two sessions that spoke <coughs> about the refugees. And the past years, we have, for example, IGF 2017, we don't have any sessions spoke about the refugees. So this is important. Uh, to know more about the, uh, to what extent the digital rights is important for refugees, we have to start by defining uh, what's the meaning of refugees. Uh, the main uh, key document that defines the refugees is 1951 convention related to the refugee status. And they define refugees as a person who is outside his or her country of nationality, of nationality uh, or habitual uh, residence has well-founded fear of being persecuted because of his or her race, religion, nationality, membership of social political group, or political opinion, and is unable or unwilling to avail him or herself of the protection of that country. This is the definition of the refugees. If we speak about, our, or if we uh, focus on this definition, we find that the refugees is individual who forced it to leave here or her country without our he leave uh, family and friends and loved person behind without any connection. So now, we, when you speak about the country, the host country of refugees, if we see that this country, of course, the trends of countries or, or the policies of countries dealing with refugees is different from country to other. So if we speak or focus about these countries is adopt uh, restricted policies uh, for refugees, like if we speak about the, in the MENA region, maybe the access to internet is very, very, very limited. Uh, maybe the, pers the education, access to education is very, very limited. Uh, maybe this country put uh, a very uh, high structure on family reunification, so it's not easy for Rigi to bring his family to the host country. So, and also, if we speak about the right, uh, the right to association, maybe also this country put restriction to, to assembly or try to assembly or to, like, set up an organization or uh, NGOs to discuss about their problems. In this time, so the, the, the digital rights or the access to internet be the last, last resort for this person to communicate, to gather, to discuss 
to express an opinion about many issues related to them, whether in the country of uh, origin or in the host country. Now, I will go briefly in my intervention about the legal framework. I will not, I will not operate in the legal framework of digital rights because I know that most of you are experts in this, or at least have uh, excellent uh, knowledge about the digital rights. So I will focus on, on some challenge, legal challenge, that face the refugees to access the right uh, digitally. Uh, the first, the first thing about the legal from work briefly is that the old digital rights is recognized as human rights according to the many different uh, international, refugee, uh, international human rights law. If we speak about the ICPR or about uh, about other convention about international human rights, uh, convention of uh, economic and social culture rights, but. I will focus on the Article 19 that is used to be a cornerstone for the digital rights and especially for uh, right to expression, freedom of expression, uh, because most of refugees this based on this article to, ex to express <coughs> their opinion or to communicate with others. Uh, the problem in this article is not binding article is not like the, the states is not binding by this article and they, they can do many restriction or stop enjoying of freedom of expression. However, uh, also the second problem in digital rights for refugees, if we speak about 1951 convention as a key legal document uh, dealing with the refugee issue, is this topic is not recognized in 1950 uh, one convention. No, we don't have any articles in any provision in 1951 convention that speak about the digital rights or access to information or access to internet. The third problematic is the government uh, or the government has majority of, of refugees have not enacted any domestic legislation uh, related to refugees. So this also may problem, not on not only for the online rights, but only offline rights. Like most of countries in MENA, MENA regions don't have any legal uh, uh, documents uh, handle the situation of refugees. This is also problems Because in this situation from the legal side, the, all these refugees treated as a foreign. And also there is a different, big difference between this person as foreigner and as refugees. Also, the, the last thing I will uh, I will uh, finish it in one minute. That uh, I would like to move to to speak also to other the legal challenges which related to impact of national digital crimes legislation on the international protection of refugees. As you know, that the, this legislation, in, especially in the countries in the countries like MENA uh, in MENA regions, that is supposed to restrict the digital rights. The, this, that Arab countries put this legislation to control the access to internet and access to digital rights in general. In this time, we have very, or this legislation has impact on international protection. What is the meaning of international protection for refugees? The main core of international protection for refugees to prohibit these countries from deporting these refugees. But according to this legislation, if the refugees like write something on Facebook, the country has a right according, under this legislation to deport this person and they use the pace or the, the reason of that this person is uh, considered uh, a threat on national security. So what is the national security? No of this legislation defines the national security. They have a, a full absolute discretion to decide what is national security. For example, in Egyptian law, uh, they define the, define the national security as everything may be uh, if you speak about the military or uh, Ministry of Interior, this is considered national security and gives the, the country a right to deport the refugees. Since this impact of national legislation or national crime uh, legislation on the international protections. 
To conclude my interventions briefly, I think it's extremely important to amend <coughs> the existing legal framework related to refugees, like, for example, 1951 Convention. I see that we have to amend it and to uh, add some articles related to digital rights for refugees to at least making sure that as in, in the domestic level, if some person or some refugees are subject to any uh, sort of deportation, we can use this article uh, as argument to stop the deportation. And also, <coughs> we need to uh, do adopting a binding legal instrument related to digital rights for refugees. And so my recommend, recommendation is to amend the existing legal framework, 1950 Convention, to add articles related to digital rights for refugees, and also we have to <coughs> adopt new legal instrument uh, related to spe specifically to uh, digital rights for refugees. Thank you. Thanks, Mohammed, for that uh, very helpful introduction. Um, we will next go to Dr. Kame. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Sise Khan. I am from Senegal. I am the chairman of uh, the African Civil Society on the Information Society. It's a platform of uh, uh, 500, uh, around 600 NGOs around the continent and throughout also the African diaspora. And we are uh, focusing on uh, ICT for development in general. And uh, we congratulate Mohammed from Egy Axis Egypt, who uh, uh, proposed this, uh, uh, this idea of workshop that has been accepted by the IGF. And uh, I will just uh, talk in a general sense about the issue. But I trust that there are uh, some more experienced people around the table and also the audience, uh, maybe, uh, to elaborate more. So the African Civil Society uh, on the Information Society axis is based in Senegal, and uh, we are operating throughout uh, our network of organizations and also people who are members. And uh, we have been uh, launched uh, in 2003 during the World Summit on the Information Society. And uh, we develop projects in uh, advocacy and uh, sensitizing uh, on uh, various issues related to internet and the ICTs, uh, like uh, access, like also the threats of, uh, uh, of the internet, also uh, training about uh, <coughs> internet access and also advocating for uh, the, the issues of affordability and uh, linguist di linguistic <coughs> diversity and uh, also uh, local localization of uh, of uh, the process of the internet and also local uh, local cultures and languages so if you go uh, throughout our website uh, you can see what <coughs> what we are doing we are present in many of the debates and uh, our members are uh, participating in, uh, in the general debates and also we have participated in uh, this internet university project <coughs> that has been uh, launched by UNESCO. We even applied and uh, we continue to, to contribute throughout our members. Uh, regarding uh, uh, the issue of refugees and, uh, and, in, uh, and their rights, we <coughs> consider that uh, uh, there is an ongoing debate between uh, 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 the relationship between uh, the rights online and the rights offline. And uh, we, we think that uh, all the rights uh, offline should be also implemented online because the societies are really moving very fastly uh, into the, the, the digital transformation. And uh, there is no uh, time uh, to waste uh, to make uh, these rights offline matching with the, the new reality. And everybody is now having a smartphone and having a, uh, is connected. And uh, there are lots of uh, new rights that should be really taken into account. And we call upon the specialists uh, on, of the issue to really tackle the issue of the rights online. Because uh, it's moving very fast and uh, we cannot just ignore it. 
and also when it comes to refugees in general, uh, we consider that they are human beings and uh, that uh, um, all the rights uh, that are for human beings should be also for them. And uh, the only thing uh, which is really complicating the issue is that uh, refugees are all, all, very often um, displaced people and uh, they don't always live in uh, the best conditions. And uh, may, sometimes maybe uh, talking about internet could be maybe a, a luxury because sometimes they don't have water, clean water, they don't have toilets, they don't, can, cannot settle and uh, they don't have links with their uh, country of origin and they don't uh, express themselves. Sometimes they are just put in jail because of... So, and also we see that in some countries, uh, even the, the soldiers who were meant to, to protect them, they are raping the girls and they are pu putting pressure and giving money and exploiting them. So they are facing lots of threats. And uh, beyond uh, the issue of ICT and the digital issue, we should, to, we should really uh, help um, to, to, to raise uh, these, uh, these uh, big threats that are facing. And maybe one of the best way is uh, to use the ICT as a mean to, to seize, to, to wait on the, on the processes, to make them having uh, their own rights in all uh, aspects. And uh, you know, in Africa, uh, Africa is one of the most uh, uh, one, one of the continent where we have most of refugees, uh, 20, 26 percent of the world's refugees population are Africans. And uh, we, you have wars in uh, many, many countries. We have refugees in, uh, in, in, in uh, Sudan, in Ethiopia, in Uganda, Cameroon, Chad, Egypt also. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are giving uh, employment to the UNHCR, to the old organizations. So they should also uh, think about how they can really uh, uh, to help fulfilling their, 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 their rights. And we think that uh, the digital issue can be uh, a sort of a raccourci to help them uh, to tackle uh, their uh, major challenges. Um, also, uh, there is a, um, um, the issue is so critical that the, um, the African <coughs> Union, uh, uh, my organization is a member of the African Union Civil Society um, um, uh, body, which is the Economic, Social, and Cultural uh, uh, Council of the African Union, and uh, you, I am happy to inform you that the, the year 2019 will be uh, the year of uh, the return the refugees, returnees, and internally displaced persons. Uh, so we are going to, to organize lots of debates and also lots of uh, uh, actions uh, around the issue of refugee. And uh, that's why we are expecting to have really good recommendations from this workshop so that we can bring it to the African Union and uh, we can uh, voice for the refugees at uh, the political level at the African Union because we are, um, at the ECOSOC, we are working on ICT issues and I am in charge of uh, the ICT component of the ECOSOC. So which year was that? ECOSOC is the... Next year, 20, 2019, starting 1st of January, it will be the year of refugees. That, that shows how uh, we are really uh, re concerned by the issue of uh, refugees and internally displaced persons. And also, uh, to finish on that, uh, we have two components. Uh, the first component is the, the refugees in Africa, so displaced person from a country to another from a region to another. But we also have uh, the refugees uh, from Africa outside of Africa. And uh, maybe uh, we can look it also at, at this aspect at a, in a positive way because uh, most of them are, uh, in some countries, they are uh, living in better conditions and they are uh, going to school and they are um, making uh, progress in all their uh, education and uh, we see that uh, recently uh, uh, a refugee who were living in a camp in Kenya a few years ago, she became a congresswoman in the U.S. 
she is from Somalia. And, and this is a, a good example of how uh, we can uh, help uh, these people because they are just human beings and they just want to live a normal life. How we can help them? And uh, if uh, coming back to the digital, and I only finish there, I think the rights are uh, the same uh, than in other all countries in Africa, which is the, the access, access to ICT, access to internet, but also. Um, <coughs> The, the cost of internet is very, uh, very, uh, very heavy for them. Sometimes they don't even have a penny uh, to have connection, and they need to be uh, in touch with their country of origin or their region of origin. Also, um, uh, the, the issue of uh, access to local languages and to local contents, sometimes uh, they are just lost in this... Uh, <coughs> This panorama, uh, because uh, they are disconnected with all their, uh, uh, all these are normally uh, also digital rights, as they are human beings. So I think uh, UNESCO has been doing a, a great job on these issues, and uh, I think that there is a need uh, really to come up with uh, more concrete uh, proposals and solutions to. Um, really uh, put it on the table of uh, the politicians and also uh, the decision makers. And uh, just uh, to finish uh, on that, uh, we are uh, a network. We are uh, present in almost all of the African continent and on the diaspora. And uh, we are ready to voice for these uh, the refugees' rights. We are ready to accompany the, the UNESCO, but also all uh, partner organizations and to, to make uh, this year, 2019, uh, successful. And we are waiting also for your proposals uh, to, to get this done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sisei, and, and also to Mohammed for um, being so concise. Um, Shan Hong. Uh, thank you so much. My name is Xian Hong from here, UNESCO. Welcome all of you to the house, and I wish you enjoy every day here in the discussion. Thank you so much for bringing up the uh, crucial issue of refugees to the Internet Policy Forum. Yeah, it's my first time to encounter this issue. And also thank you for your organization's contribution to UNESCO's project on the Internet Universality Project. Uh, I remember how I met you, Mohammed, in, in, in Egypt when they said that UNESCO wants to advocate uh, internet universality principles. We are advocating four fundamental <coughs> principles. Internet should be developed according to uh, human rights based, uh, should be accessible by all, should be, uh, should be open, uh, should be driven by the multi-stakeholder participation. I, I do think that all these four principles should apply to refugees equally as to anybody. Uh, in the world, like uh, at the UN level, have you know you have known that we have reached the global consensus to do to achieve the sustainable development goals. We want to leave no one behind. I mean that's all what we are here about. So. I'm not an uh, expert on refugees, but uh, I've been working on digital rights for years. I mean, uh, since the U United Nations Human Rights Council uh, endorsed a very important uh, resolution in 2012, we interpret the digital rights from the uh, angle of international human rights framework, that, uh, which means that all the human rights as uh, endorsed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights <coughs> should be equally applied offline as online. Um, well, this year happened to be the 70 years anniversary of the, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, we are celebrating the Human Rights Day on 10th of December as well, so may, that may also be an occasion we should really uh, think about these issues. Uh, in specific to the digital rights, um, as I mentioned that UNESCO recent position on the universality uh, <clears throat> we had a core mandate uh, in our constitution to defend the freedom of expression, and after 2015, uh, our member states endorsed a new uh, position to uh, address the internet governance, uh, which, as I mentioned, is called the internet universality with those four uh, principles. So by human rights-based approach, we have identified uh, a number of key rights we think should be highlighted in the internet 
the ecosystem. I think that's uh, equally applied to refugee situation. Um, I recently saw news that when uh, when the refugee came to a country, um, yes, they first asked for uh, water, shelter, but then they also asked for a mobile phone, asked for a Wi-Fi, asked for a connection. You can imagine how ICT and internet are being so central to satisfy their basic need and also to uh, to strengthen their well-beings. And by human rights online, I mean digital age, we said that, uh, I mean, we have identified five or six key area. We know human rights is really uh, so broad. First one, freedom, freedom of expression. Uh, it's not a luxury. I think it's, it's equally essential, essential as the food and the water uh, for refugees as well. And second one is freedom of information, which means access to the governmental information, to public health information. That's a right for citizens, but uh, shouldn't we also have it for the individuals, for the people um, in the fragile, in a vulnerable situation like refugees? And uh, third, uh, a dimension about the privacy. Uh, privacy, I, I know we have, we're having a great expert on that. I mean, privacy and personal data protection, it's, it's become a crucial issue impacting dignity of everybody in the digital age. And then we look at uh, <clears throat> the freedom of association as a right to how everybody, individual, can engage in the public life, in, in the public policy making, uh, equally essential for the refugees. Um, lastly, we look at a broader dimension of uh, economic, uh, social, and uh, cultural rights of everybody in digital age. Uh, since we are now living on internet, we couldn't live without it. Uh, so it's a part of our everyday life, uh, the right to education, right, <coughs> right to uh, participating in the cultural life. Uh, I saw you are looking at me, I'm, I'm also not finishing. Uh, in addition to this rights-based approach, um, as our colleague just mentioned about the access, I mean, connectivity, the cost, affordability, uh, they are all covered by the universality principles of, uh, in terms of access. By accessing not just uh, the infrastructure, you cannot just give them a mobile phone, they can get everything. <coughs> you also need to think about the quality of the access, if they are uh, relevant, uh, useful content uh, uh, to them, and also look at the language issue. Uh, uh, again, um, capacity, I mean the literacy, internet uh, ICTs are also developing on a daily basis and social media platforms, uh, artificial intelligence and blockchains, they are changing, they are giving our new opportunities and also threats on a daily basis. I think we also keep these people, I mean, to be educated, informed to, with the latest <coughs> scales to make sure that uh, they are equally benefiting from the development of uh, ICTs. Very last point I want to point out is the gender divide and the children issue, which are always at my heart at UNESCO's mandate. We have the, in this framework, we, have, we are mainstreaming the gender divide issues. I mean, uh, I don't know if you have statistics among the refugee community, uh, uh, the difference between <coughs> women, women and the men, their access and their use of the ICT. Uh, maybe they are having maybe more, even more, more barriers to that. That uh, equally, I mean, children, well, they are always in a position to be, to be empowered uh, with these digital skills and uh, to be safe. So I stop here and uh, look forward to more uh, discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Shang, Shang Kong, also for being concise. And I know also you have a, a meeting tomorrow at four. Oh, yeah. Is that right? If um, if people are interested in finding out more about UNESCO's work. Please come along. Um, okay, now, Aaron has been patiently watching us from the screen. Um, Aaron, have you heard everything? I've heard. Perfect. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, wonderful. So, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, good afternoon everyone. And I'm sorry, I couldn't be a um, these things happen. Uh, I wanna thank one of the very pressing issues I'm glad we're here to discuss. A little bit about myself, so who I am and, and why I'm uh, on the panel, and then I'll uh, dive into a specific issue around um, access to mobile connectivity and, and financial services. So I'm a postdoc at the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology, and Society. Uh, at this institute, I work with Lynn Taylor, Professor Leonard Taylor, on an ERC project uh, focused on global data justice. And we're aiming to make the case for connecting 
digital rights and freedoms globally, which I think is relevant to today's discussion. My focus is on humanitarian data and the ethical issues related to both personal and non-personal data that arise in cybersecurity risk. Um, I'd like to note that UNHCR is in the process of refreshing its connectivity for refugee strategy um, to make it more rights-based, uh, for example, by looking at connectivity as a human right. This is work in progress, uh, and I advise you all to keep an eye on their website for further updates and, and activity around the strategy. Now today I'd like to discuss a related topic, which is how legal and regulatory frameworks uh, and requirements therein for providing identity, approved identity, for obtaining a SIM card or opening a bank account have created barriers to access in, in different ways. So these are different legal and regulatory frameworks than those that we'll have to discuss, but I think they're nonetheless quite important. To give you a sense of the scale,
Thanks, Aaron. That's great. So we've had, I think, from our speakers, a really good uh, introduction, um, a look at um, the, the relevant legal framework, um, broader, inf broader issues of um, refugee rights, um, a number of ideas on ways that the situation could be improved. So UNESCO's work on Internet Universality One, a number from Aaron uh, of mentions of work by uh, UNHCR, by GSMA, and others. So we have 15 minutes left in our session, um, and it's time to bring everyone else in. Um, could I ask you, please, for our uh, moderator's sake, that you say um, your name and your affiliation at the start of your intervention? Um, you're welcome to give a, a, a concise uh, comment, if you wish, if you could keep that perhaps to, to 30 to 60 seconds, please, so everyone can get a chance, um, and to ask a question. If you have a question, could you please um, indicate which of the four speakers you are putting your question to, just so that we have the, the best opportunity for everyone who would like to get involved to do so. Could you help me by putting your hand up if you have a comment or a, a question that you would like to make? So we've got, we've immediately got two. That's a good start, so please. Um, good afternoon, Pinder Wong from Hong Kong. Um, I just want to make a, an observation with respect to, I think, Mohammed's opening comments on the legality of it, because legal identity has been the, one of the common themes which really harks back to kind of a Westphalian view, you know, from 1648. I think there is a new tool in the toolbox, and I think uh, 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 Shen Huang uh, and also Aaron mentioned um, blockchain technologies and tokenization. I think there is a new tool in the toolbox, and that is to recognize that these displaced persons and these refugees who seek uh, legal identity might have an alternative. In other words, they may not have legal certainty, but they may have cryptographic certainty. So in the digital realm, in the space of Bitcoin, which I've been playing with for the last sort of three or four years, i.e. this new edge technology, there is a new tool in the policy toolbox, commonly called blockchain, but we, more pragmatically, it's the ability to use a cryptocurrency to engender economic activity. So it's not just an issue of asking for handouts. And so the suggestion here, specifically to the observation for next year in Africa, is to really start thinking about livelihood and the right to work. Why? Because mother, sort of necessity is the mother of invention. These people are probably going to be the most creative um, in the world, uh, almost by necessity. And so if we provide them digital tools, they will be able to empower themselves and work digitally. So the right to work digitally is something that I would feel passionate about. I think cryptocurrencies uh, enable that, but I think there's a very, very limited window where, for example, a authorized cryptographic currency versus vis-a-vis -vis some of the other ones, um, there is this window before all this stuff becomes underground because the tools already exist. So therefore, tool provision to enable them to provide cryptographic, the use of cryptographic currencies so that they have the ability to work and the right to work online is something that I would suggest that uh, the African Union look at. Thank you. Thank you, Pinda. Marianne, could I ask you to use a mic, please, for the remote um, participants? Maybe he, he, there's one here. Yeah, anyone, just to press yeah the that's it. Oh, hi, Marianne Franklin, Internet Rights and Principles Coalition. Uh, thanks for this a very important panel. Um, refugees have specific rights under international law. Refugees also have human rights under international law. So my question is, how is it possible that refugees, asylum seekers, displaced persons, and newcomers find simple things such as access to the web, uh, the ability to be able to use their mobile phones? Why are these things taken away from them? when they have the misfortune, and I call it the misfortune of finding themselves in detention centers or a removal centers, how is it possible that they are, uh, that their rights as refugees and as human beings are subtracted away from by virtue of their situation? I'd like a concrete answer from any government and also any technical community people here, please. Thank you. Also, just <laughs> while I've got the floor, um, the second part of this uh, theme will be continuing at 9 o'clock on Wednesday morning with our refugees and rights. So thank you very much, panel. Thanks, Marianne. Since Marianne asked a very specific question before I go back to the panel, is there, is there anyone from a, a, gov a national government or intergovernmental organization um, or from the technical community that would like to, to respond to Marianne's point? Anybody? Maybe, to, maybe, at your, maybe at your meeting, Marianne, they will meet your, your challenge. Um, Let the question stand, then, on the record. <laughs> um, 
which of our panellists would like to come back on the first, po first point? Okay, sorry. About the livelihood, uh, I would mean to mention that the, it's supposed that we have someone from Egyptian government to speak about the livelihood. So the livelihood component, it was supposed to one of our uh, uh, sessions component to discuss, but unfortunately the speaker has excused in the last time. So I, I agree with you, the livelihood and trust work is very, very important in digital rights or to sh make sure that the refugees has access to internet and access to digital rights have a, a, a big impact on uh, the livelihood uh, issues related to refugees because if we speak about the, like, uh, the refugees, if they, in some countries they don't have access to work because they need work permit and the government don't give the refugees a, a work permit. So last resort for these refugees to make some work through the internet. And actually this happened now in Egypt. Egypt don't allow to refugees to work uh, uh, legally. So they now start to make some <coughs> their own work uh, through internet and they have some Facebook pages to announce about their, uh, their work. So I agree with you on that. And also I would like to relate, relate this by, uh, with the, the, my colleague here mentioned about the gender because you know most of the, the women refugees don't have access to internet and this, there is some statistics by UNCR they mentioned that only I, as a member Two percent of women has access to refugees. Uh, women have access to internet. So, uh, most, for experience in Egypt, most of African uh, refugees in, Ex in Egypt are uh, women, not men, uh, with children, without the husband. So, I think ensure or make sure that they have access to internet, and we give them some resolution about uh, to solve the uh, language barriers. I think it will be good to. Uh, make some work and earn some money to, to leave. So that's it. Great. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, who would like to come in, please? Sorry, I'm not commenting, <laughs> but I was just uh, making a submission. Um, maybe I came in a bit late. Maybe it was addressed. Um, my name is Lilian Naroga. I'm from Uganda. Um, on the issue, I know I've heard about the rights issues, you know, having access to information, connect to family and all that. Um, but just wondering, because in many cases, um, uh, on the issue of refugees, is there's the issue of cost, access to the devices themselves. There are times that uh, when refugees go into a place, their devices are confiscated. Uh, away from that, but there's also the issue of... Uh, having money to buy the gadgets themselves and also connecting, you know, buying, having money to connect this. And um, probably someone may have mentioned it from the submissions earlier. How, my question is, has there been in, any sort of engagements to work with uh, service providers to provide any sort of, you know, discounts to mobile phones themselves but also to the internet because I also think I, I think that this could be one way of making life a little bit more easier and friendlier to have some sort of subsidized uh, uh, cost or fees to you know have access to these connectivity gadgets. Great, thank you. I wonder, Aaron, if you would like to come in because I know you've worked in the past with telcos and you mentioned GSMA. Groups. I know China, I don't want to um, misstate the, the country, but I know for sure UNHCR on occasion has done this. Uh, it was somewhere in the Middle East. It was either Jordan or Lebanon. I can, I can get the specifics for you soon, but they, because it's quite expensive mobile connectivity there and that cost was one of the major barriers. They've essentially negotiated a, a refugee plan. I hate to, I hate to use the, the label, but um, it provides a much more cost effective access to to, uh, to groups there. Just, then just uh, like a recommendation or about the, uh, how to solve the, the contemporary issue and the price of the cost to access to internet for refugees. I think one of uh, maybe the solution for that if we choose that maybe UNCR in cooperation with the, govern the host uh, country governments if we set up some like uh, 
some center, centers f uh, that offer the, the service free for refugees, I will maybe solve the problem. If we speak about the like access to education, maybe the students, or we can say that e education centers for, for the students, for refugees, you can access to this place uh, without any charge, and also for livelihood, maybe also make some uh, like cyber nets uh, <coughs> shops for, or centers, uh, especially for refugees to, uh, they have access to this without paying any, 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 any money for that. I think maybe solve the problem or to cope with the, to the problem of the cost. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think, as, as I said earlier, there is a le also the level of priority uh, for some of, uh, for most of these refugees, uh, they don't have even a place to just to, uh, to sleep. Sometimes uh, food is a, a, a problem. So, and also the issue of the country where they are living is, is important. Whether it is a, a wealthy country, where it is a developing country, uh, there may be uh, some priorities uh, to, to check. And, uh, but I am hopeful that uh, ICT as a, uh, as a tool can be maybe a way to ease their life. For example, uh, uh, I, I like your, your proposals about uh, the displaced persons in, in Africa. And I think uh, if there are some, some solutions, uh, we are open and we can uh, talk at a, at a decision-making level. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, we have four minutes left. I know we have one question here. Any, anyone else want to make a, a last-minute short intervention? Two and then three. Okay, so we'll take all three and then we'll have final words from the panel, if that's okay. Please. Uh, Edmund Chung from Dot Asia. Um, I'm, I'm very supportive of, of the discussion and, and I, I hear with a lot of interest, but I, I have a, I guess, a more maybe a stupid or a question. Um, I, I may have come in a little bit late and missed it. I, I understand this is a part of, part of rights, but how, like, I'm sure many countries and, and jurisdictions have protocols for handling refugees. How many of those have connectivity in those protocols at this point? And I, the question, I, the reason why I ask this is, where is the fight right now? Is it to get the governments to adopt this as part of the protocol for, for dealing with re refugees, or is that already in? And it's a matter of uh, economics to, to, to implement it. So I don't know whether that has been answered. No, it hasn't, and that's a great question. <coughs> Please. Oh, hi, I'm Faith Lee. I'm also, I'm a youth representative from Dot Asia organization. So to add on to um, a point that was raised just now, um, so I think that it would be crucial for government, orga gover um, government intergovernmental organizations as well as these um, service providers to work together in order to um, provide more welfare and um, for these refugees um, to um, increase the connectivity, which they currently have very limited access to. So I was wondering whether or not it would be possible to perhaps, um, or are there any specific ways to provide the, um, this kind of welfare to them? For example, could you perhaps distribute bandwidth or could you perhaps create a, a, a refugee-specific channel for them to have access to? and or maybe create a local community network. So actually, I'm aware that there is a network in place called Loon. So it's essentially designed to bring internet connectivity to rural and remote communities worldwide. But then obviously, um, one project like this might not be adequate to cover um, such a global issue. So I was just wondering, what are the specific ways to make this kind of welfare happen. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, um, again, Pinder Wong from Hong Kong again. Uh, suggestion um, for I think labels matter, and although we refer to them as internally displaced or refugees or economic migrants, I would like to suggest for this group, since it is sort of digitally focused, um, to consider the following, which is I refer to everyone as being uh, netizen expatriates, net expats. Right? Why? Because we've already moved 4 billion people online in the last 20 years and no one seemed to have noticed. Right? So digital, you know, in the digital realm, it's space enough for everyone. 
And so if we begin with, in, in some sense, the digital space or the netizen space and view them as sort of netizen expatriates, I mean, there are a group of people who travel the world with a bag and a phone, with multi-banked and multi-currency, and, and they do that. And so if we turn, take a more positive view that they can contribute to every do, uh, domestic economy, and again, I suggest you consider the term netizen expatriate. Thank you. Thank you for that. So we're already overrunning. So what I want to do to very quickly wrap up is I'll go to each of our speakers if they would like to respond to the two questions or the final statement. Great. Um, if you have any immediate closing thoughts, but I think people will start coming in the door in the next couple of minutes. Um, so let's be quick. So I'll go in the same order as they spoke. So um, Mohammed, please. So the only thing I would like to say in the end of this session is that the digital rights is a solution for the problems that refugees already faced uh, uh, in the fact, because if we speak, they face a problem to get access to education, access to health care, uh, access to work. So the only solution now, the digital rights. So I'm, I would like to stress in this. We have to ensure that and to uh, make sure that they have access to these rights to solve the problem of uh, access to their offline in host countries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the, the digital rights of refugees are um, just uh, uh, an anchoring point and, uh, and a big um, um, uh, a, a bigger problem, a more problem, a uh, plus problem. They have more uh, specific needs. They have more uh, priorities to live and to to be uh, in a good situation of uh, livelihood and uh, maybe sometimes just to have something to eat. And that uh, we have already uh, uh, rules for human beings about internet, about access. We can use the same rules, but that that means that there there are uh, some um, good. Uh, solutions in uh, every country because a refugee is first a uh, human being. Thank you. Uh, th thank you so much. I learned a lot from all of you. I, I, I think, yeah, we should uh, think about how we can mainstream the digital rights, human rights aspect to the, those international policies or legal frameworks, but also in you know, the about the national protocols about refugees, as uh, Adam mentioned. And plus, I think uh, uh, digital rights should not be violated and should be not should not be isolated from considering the the internet, I mean, digital age as an entire. I mean, we should also look at how we enable these rights by, by promoting access, right, a content, um, gender equality, children empowerment, as well as the, um, I mean, as I'm still looking at the renovate approach of governance called a multi-stakeholder approach. I was in a session this morning and someone said, ah, oh, it's not working, but I would say that this should be working also for solving the refugee issues. Look, I mean, everybody can offer a solution. I'm from a technical community, we can offer a technical solution. And from the IGOs, we can offer a legal and regulatory framework and options, policy options. And national governments, I mean, NGOs, civil societies, and academia, I mean, they all have a role here. To, to play when it's a shared responsibility and also we need the expertise and um, resources and service, and service providers. I mean, they could ma provide some immediate solution. I mean, refugees are living in such a tight uh, situation to be, uh, to, I mean, to be empowered. So I do um, I promote, uh, I think, the multi-stakeholder approach to be one on the agenda for, for the future to engage actors uh, on the table to, to create more synergies and to supporting this refugee issue. Again, thank you for advertising our event tomorrow at 4 p.m. room 10. We can really continue some part of discussion here. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chan Hong. And Aaron? Thanks, Ian. Um, yeah. I'll be very brief. I just want to say that these are very complicated issues, and um, I'd be very sort of cautious of any easy solutions. Refugees are just one population, uh, among others, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, returnees, uh, stateless people, uh, they all present um, you know, very complex uh, realities and, and, and we need to account for all of those different groups and, and the sort of specifics of their 
their situations as we think through these issues of digital age. Thank you all. Great. So thank you again to our speakers, to everyone that's come along and contributed, and I hope that um, in 2019 we can meet in Berlin and discuss lots of activity um, that uh, improves these situations. Thank you.